Hello, and thank you so much for checking out this episode of More with Stumpo. Today, I speak with Bob Wagner, who used to be a firefighter, who now works for the Department of the Army as a USAR instructor. He has a very interesting career. He does dive into details with that and also dis- discusses his new job that he does have. Later on, he discusses where he plans on going for his career. I find it very interesting, and I hope you find it very interesting as well. If you do, please hit that like button for me. Also, if you want to leave a comment, leave any type of question or comment that you have, share this video with your friends or family or whoever else that you think knows them or would enjoy it, and also subscribe to the channel, and then hit that notification bell when I make new content, you get notified. So thank you so much. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode, and Happy New Year. All right, bud. So we're going to go ahead and try this again. Go ahead and let the audience know. We got cut off when we recorded a couple of days ago. The power went out. I think it was the government. Because <laughs> we said too many buzzwords. They said too many buzzwords. They <laughs> shut us off. That's what I think personally. But today, I've got you, Bob Wagner. Bob, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell the people what you do for a living. And then we're going to talk about your history and in your life. Uh, I'm Robert Wagner, a.k.a. Bob Wagner. And um, I don't know, where, where should I start? Should I talk about my my history in the fire service or where, about your history in where the I fire progressed? Service. Yeah. Yeah, so I got my start in Madison County as a volunteer firefighter. I went from there. I went to paramedic school and got my college degree as well at IPUI. And Greenwood was a place that picked me up. That's probably my first big boy job, paying job. Wasn't there very long. Ended up uh, being hired by the Lexington, Kentucky Fire Department. And I was there for a couple years, great years. Had a great time. I worked there on the U.K. campus there at Station 5 for a while, which was just a young man's dream come true. (laughs) It really was. And then uh, the opportunity came along to come back to Indiana and work for the Indianapolis Fire Department. And so I was there for uh, six years, the last year being on a leave of absence, serving uh, for the Department of the Army as an urban search and rescue training instructor in Camp Dawson, West Virginia. Decided that I absolutely loved it, and it was fulfilling a dream for me, which we'll, we, I'm assuming we'll get into. We'll talk about you know my progression and why I went that way. And decided that you know since that was the case and I was happy and I was loving it, I decided I would stay. And so um, now I work full-time. That is, you know, no, no longer with IFD. But I work full-time for the Department of the Army, again, as an urban search and rescue training instructor. That is really cool, man. Did you get a lot of, uh, did you get a lot of guys that were pretty upset that you left the job? I don't know if I would say upset as much as I would say maybe it kind of hurt their feelings. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Sure, there were some people who were like happy to see me go, right? <laughs> but when you're a polarizing figure, you know, and that's true of everybody to some degree, especially for me, is I, I can be very polarizing. But uh, you know, no, very, very, very supportive folks. Um, you know, some names that that come to mind. We talked about Adam Markins the other day. A tremendous influence on me in my career. He was somebody who reached out to me. Very supportive. Uh, Chief Kevin Jones, the Special Operations Chief for IFD, another very supportive voice. And again, I don't think anybody was upset so much as just maybe uh, feelings with hurt, were hurt maybe a little bit because that, you know, a, a fault of mine, admittedly, uh, there towards the end, my communication wasn't the best just because I was so wrapped up in school and everything else going on. Um, but I still have, obviously, good friends there that I speak to regularly. And then, of course, one right now, Curtis, who's going mm-hmm. through the academy, is very, still a very close friend. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I guess I could put it this way is that if I, if I wasn't a good communicator and, and, uh, you know, which I know that I wasn't, then I apologize and, I, and I'm sorry if I did uh, make anyone feel that way. But, you know, too, there is an element of there that I do think in the fire service, we, we very much, we're very proud people, mm-hmm. right? And, I, and I'm going to talk about myself like I'm still a firefighter because I still consider myself one. We're very proud people, very proud culture, which is a good thing. And so sometimes if you leave an organization, you know, it, there's, it does, you know, hit you in the honor a little bit, right? There's a little bit of an honor challenge there. You know, pe- people are, you know, kind of makes them feel a, a little bit hurt in that way too because maybe they feel like you've, you've challenged their or questioned their identity a little bit. And so that's not the intention at all. And, and I think as we'll get into, uh, for me, this was a progression that was always in the works and, and it just was a, a, a dream that came true at the right time. I knew where I was going all along, and I think a lot of folks did too. Um, but but there is a little bit of a dynamic of that going on too there, I'm sure. But um, no hard feelings. It was it was a great time, and I loved my time at the sevens. Uh, I really loved my time at the thirty ones too, and the thirteens. I mean, I worked. I had to work some great places with some great folks, and I'm still consider myself very close with with a lot of my classmates. 
And I'm sure a lot of rumors went around when you left for your year of absence. So go ahead and uh, <laughs> you, you joined the CIA, obviously. <laughs> no, so a rumor that was going around was that you joined the CIA. Yeah, well, isn't, it's f- isn't, isn't, that's a true rumor, correct? <laughs> it's funny that you've heard that rumor. Um, because I thought it was just one big funny joke because guys on the job would say that. Because so I, I got very fortunate. I had the opportunity to go study at the Naval Postgraduate School for a year and a half while I was at IFD. IFD supported my participation, which I'd lo- hopefully we'll get into. It's a, a free master's degree program available to state and local public safety workers ex- as well as those that work in the Department of, of Homeland Security. And so it's something that I, I would like to see Indiana more represented in. So we'll, we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. Um. But the, the department supported me while I basically left work for two weeks at a time over a year and a half until I took my leave of absence to go study in Monterey, California. And so it kind of created this weird pattern of me sneaking off for two weeks at a time. And plus, on top of that, some folks were aware of some of the other things I had going on, like working with the DEA. I've done a lot of work with DEA, Chicago's quick response team, doing some rescue and, and hazmat and tactical medicine related stuff for them. So I think that just kind of fueled it. And again, I thought it was just a sick joke or, or a dumb joke because I heard it so often at the firehouse until I had breakfast out of the blue with someone I used to work with down in Kentucky. And he, we sit down at breakfast and he goes, so I, I heard you're, you're in the CIA now. And he was serious. I was like, you're, you're joking, right? He's like, no, I, I heard that's what you do. <laughs> I was like, no, no, not at all. Not, not, not even close. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was a, a, a funny rumor that, like, s- spun out into a real thing. It's just just funny how, how things get around and things can come around like that. Uh, but, no, I do not work for the CIA. I'm not, not that caliber at all. Well, not yet, at least. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so we talked about, you, you mentioned the uh, NPS, the Naval Postgraduate, Naval School. Postgraduate School. You said that it's just a, a free master's d- pr- degree program. You obviously would have to have a bachelor's before you would go, correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, that's the tough part. I was actually talking with Jacob about that last night. Uh, Did you suggest it to him? He's somebody I would like to see go. Dude, he actually talked about having a, uh, an actual sen- – well, I'm not going to speak for Jacob. <laughs> well, well, well he, what I will say – showed interest, and then we talked about it would be a bachelor's. He goes, well, that, wouldn't that have to mean that you'd get your bachelor's? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. And he's like, that's a little bit more tougher. And I'm like – yeah, Th- does he not him. have a bachelor's degree? I'm not trying to put him on no, the spot. I well, he but if he no. did, so um, a good friend of mine, Jake Hoffman, who you you mm-hmm. are hopefully going to have on here, he's a great person. He's a, just a great he human. Run. He will. I'll make it. Mm-hmm. That's right. Crazy Uncle Bob's got this. <laughs> um, he's working on his bachelor's right now, but his end goal is to go to MPS. And there's actually a program that you can attend in the interim until you have your master's degree called the Emergence Program. And he went and did that. Now, it's not as long. It's a little shorter, and I think you're only supposed to go to Monterey twice. And it's only, I want to say, six months in duration. I, I, I didn't attend it, so I don't know, but he did, and he loved it. And I think he actually worked it out where he got some credit for it towards his bachelor's degree. But that fueled his fire and gave him, some, gave him the taste of it, and now he knows that once he completes his bachelor's degree, he wants to go there. And so I would encourage that to guys like, like Jacob or, or anyone who's listening who's like, man, I don't even have my bachelor's degree yet. Well, here's an outlet. You can go and still get a taste of that and, and apply it towards your bachelor's if you so desire. And if you enjoy it like Jake did and like I certainly did, then you can. it gives you a goal, right, to start working towards. And, again, it, it's it's free. You can't beat free, right? And so what do I mean when I say free? Well, it, for anybody who's attended like or, or taken the opportunity to go to the Center for Domestic Preparedness in Anniston, Alabama, and take like what they call the live agent course, or to Surtsey in Colorado, or the bomb class that everybody talks about in New Mexico, it works the same way. They pay for everything. They pay for your airfare. They pay for your lodging. Uh, you get a stipend. You get per diem for food. So I, I actually ended up making money sometimes in that because of that. And of course, they paid for all my books. You know, I've got a stack of books here that that they provided me, and of course, the education itself. And you're on the beach or within eye shot of the beach there in Monterey, California, you know, Central Coast, California, you can't beat it. It's just a wonderful time. And the people you meet and and the experiences you have and the conversations like this, like you and I have had some great conversations. This reminds me a lot of going to NPS because you just get into those deep level conversations and really start cracking open some of these deep level problems. And so folks like, like, you know, again, Harshi's somebody I'd really like to see pursue that. He would be very successful there. 
and anybody like him. And again, if, if, if anybody out there ever wanted help, then I always offer, like, seriously, anybody who might be listening, just, just give me a call or shoot me an email, even shoot me a text. And people, people helped me get in. And what I, what I mean by get in is they, they helped me understand what to expect. They kind of, um, gave me some guidance in writing my essays. Didn't cheat for me, certainly, but gave me some guidance. And of course I had peer editors who edited all my work and just work to help make me successful because they wanted to see me be successful there. And so, you know, you give back when someone does something that for you. That's that's kind of the the catch, right? You you need to help the next person that comes along. And because I care about it and I want to see Indiana represented there, then anybody who might be listening and decides that it might be something they want to do, then give me a call and I'll, I'll do what I can to help you. And definitely if if anybody does is is interested in that, you can DM me cuz it's probably going to be easier than other than just Unless you put your number or your email out, sure, I'll you put guys, my email out at the end. Okay, of this. and yeah. then we can. I'll put that down in the description. But if anything, anybody can DM me, and I'll just push you forward to him. Please, which is the easiest. So, what I meant to ask before we talked about uh, NPS was what your job entails for the Department of the for the Department of the Army. So, what do sure. you instruct? What are your details of your or the description of your position? Okay. Um, well, obviously, before I go any further, I don't represent or speak for the Department of the Army in my capacity here today. So, right, a shameless plug that has to be put out there, or the Department of Defense. Uh, but I am an urban search and rescue instructor. Uh, I think my official title is urban search and rescue training instructor, uh, 1711 job series in the civil service for the U.S. Department of the Army under the Department of Defense. And so I work for the Maneuver Support Center of Excellence, which is under training and doctrine command for the Department of the Army. We, we are the educational arm of the Army. In particular, I'm actually detailed out in a way with one other employee supporting National Guard Bureau at Camp Dawson, West Virginia, because we work in what's called or we support what is called the Seaburn Response Enterprise. More colloquially, wow, I messed that up. I'm not even going to try that one again. Colloquially? Yeah, right. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna butcher I just that one. I spelled it. I just missed it. <laughs> Don't worry. Colloquially. We're over there like, is that really a word? Colloquially. 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 Yeah. Cologne. Cologne. <laughs> That's all. I'm I just got. gonna leave it alone. I know the word in my head, but I can't say. I More can't commonly say. known. How's that sound? A little colloquially. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you meant. That's right. More commonly known as the Cree, Seaburn Response Enterprise, the Cree, and what's the Seaburn? What's the Seaburn acronym? Is that an acronym? Uh, yes, it is. Chemical, biological, okay, radiological, okay, nuclear. No, no, no. It's good. Yeah. I, that, like things like that should probably be clarified for folks who are listening, and aren't as familiar. So I was thinking of it as a uh, well. I was just thinking about it as like an educational part of the. Uh, program that you run. All right, because we thinking work in of training, it as a right? school or something. That's what no, no. So the Cree is, and it's actually. A subset of it is what I, I wrote my master's thesis on at NPS, but the Cree is like one giant insurance policy for America's local, state and local emergency responders in the case of major catastrophic events, in particular a domestic nuclear detonation, which is another topic I've written about to some degree, right? I just had an article published in the Army's Countering WMD Journal about that. What would urban search and rescue look like after a nuclear detonation? What would it What would it look like? How do we characterize it? What do we need to do? What do we need to be prepared for to save people if America experiences its worst day? That's and that's that feeds back into that grander mission of the Cree, which is where there is an insurance policy. We fall under a a mission of the Department of Defense. That's called defense support of civil authorities, right? So anytime a major event like that happens in the United States, obviously there's never been a, de- a, a nuclear detonation within the borders of the United States, but there have been catastrophic events where the Cree has been involved or potentially could be involved outside of that. The Department of Defense has to take, by law, a supportive role, right? I think w- before we were cut off last time by the, the power surge, uh, we kind of got into... Yeah, right. We kind of got into um, posse comitatus, Mm -hmm. right? And what that means, it's a law that basically says soldiers can't be deployed domestically in place of the police. Now, there are some exceptions to that, right? And Seaburn is kind of one of those, like a Seaburn event, because our Congress has realized that that's that's an event that could tap resources and, and stress local and state and local resources in a way they need support. But again, the Department of Defense takes a supportive role. 
um, and, and even in providing support from the federal level, it's it's the Department of Homeland Security and, and more specifically FEMA or the Federal Emergency Management Agency who is the lead agency in providing that kind of support. So again, we're, we're very much in a supportive role. But what we do have at the DOD that makes us a little unique and compared to other departments and agencies is people. We have a lot of people. It's, it's the largest department in the government, the DOD. Um, so we have a lot of folks. I didn't know that. Yeah. We have a, a lot of people. It, what's interesting is when we talked about the intelligence community before, and we were talking a little bit, dare I say his name, because that's when the power went out you last time, Mark yeah. Lowenthal. Because yeah, I got a, uh, a battery back. I went and bought. <laughs> the, I am no joke. I went and bought. We really think. I really think. Uh, <laughs> shut us off. I'm, I'm kidding. I don't. But I literally went and bought a battery backup for my computer and TV and a uh, wireless router, which won't matter. Just in case the power <laughs> ever goes off when I'm doing a podcast episode again, I have um, 157 minutes of battery backup <laughs> that I could still do. Re- I could still do recording and uh, yeah, maybe because it was catastrophic. Better. It threw, completely threw us off. It really threw my game off. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> really threw my game off. My that entire time, I'm like, I'll never save that audio. I'll never get that. Audio <laughs> it's never coming back. And you know what? It's not. But yeah, so I, we've got 157 minutes of power off that. Thing. Well, that's good to know in case we start talking about the intelligence. Community. If it goes off, I would say let's do 15 minutes <laughs> just in case. <laughs> but we'll find out. I'll find out. Maybe we'll just cut, kill the power <laughs> of the house. We'll find out how long it lasts. Well, we, so. we were talking about the intelligence community, oddly Correct. enough, when that happened, right? And so a lot of folks don't know, even amongst the intelligence community, because I know you're kind of a buff in that stuff. You told me you like to learn about the IC. A I bit. like to learn about that kind of stuff. It, it's cool, right? I, I, no, I, I, I agree. I'm no expert. Ever. No, it's, it's, it's okay. I'm not either. Um, but I, I, one thing I did learn, because you take an into a very, very good intelligence class when you go uh, uh, to the na- master's degree program at NPS, I learned that the the DOD, Department of Defense, actually has its own internal intelligence community, and it's bigger than all the other pieces of the intelligence community, like the, the CIA, the State Department, and all that. Like, their, their piece is the biggest part of it. So, yeah, we're very, the DOD is a very big organization, and so we bring a lot of people to the party when something bad happens. Um, and so my, my role in that, right? So the Seaburn Response Enterprise can be thought of as a, if, if you were to look at it and imagine it as a chart, think of an inverted triangle, uh, of response that kind of flowers out as the event expands. And it starts very local, uh, uh, very l- much on a local level, but still National Guard, but on a state and local level, with what most folks have probably heard of in the fire service as the civil support teams. So there's one in every state. Some of the territories in some states even have more than one. Um, but they're kind of like the first part, and then it, it scales out from there. I work in that second tier or work with that second tier, which is what's called the surf peas. And that first tier is local units. Well, so it's 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 their national guard, and but they are working under the authority of the state full time. Okay. So that they can still do state because there's so much layer. There's so many layers to this as far as uh, both both legal and and bureaucratic that affect how these units operate. And so they're operating under state authority primarily. And then I, the next tier is what's called the Surf Peas Seaburn Enhanced Response Force Package, and they bring an urban search and rescue element to the event. And so I train those folks. And there's also a Title X or active duty military component that's even higher up in the response matrix, and they're trained to a greater extent. So at my level where I work with the Surf Peas, they're trained to the operations level, which is lingo that, that firefighters use, uh, because we do um, in, involve... Uh, regula- regulations and, and consensus standards that apply domestically. So you, you hear a lot of things like NFPA, regardless mm-hmm. how you feel about that, thrown around. Um, but w- we, we do follow under those same, again, regulations and consensus standards. So the, the, the search and extraction elements, that's what we call them, trained in the surf peas receive training at my schoolhouse, which is the search and extraction school, on rope, confined space, and structural collapse rescue. And then the elements that are higher in this matrix, the active duty folks, they get the full technician level in all the technical rescue disciplines with the exception of swift water. So real quick, can we talk about your education level or certification level in ropes and collapse rescue? Real quick. Well, sure, you probably, it was just what, my general background? Your general background in it. 
Sure. Real, real quick, and then I got another question for you. If you want. Okay. Do you, are you wanting me to get into Grimm stuff or anything like that? I or? do, but a little bit later. A little bit later? Okay. Yeah. Right. So um, I am still a member of Indiana Task Force mm-hmm. 1, and, and that's kind of where my background in USAR comes from. Of course, I've done some uh, things outside of that. I've, I, Like I said earlier, I've supported the DEA's quick response team, which provides – uh, what's called ESF 13, Emergency Support Function 13, force protection for the FEMA urban search and rescue teams when they go out the door to do um, ur- urban search and rescue stuff on, on deployments, right, at, at major national events. And, and of course, state in, within state border events, too. Um, but I am rope rescue technician, confined space, trench, vehicle machinery, structural collapse, swift water, all. Does that exact answer your question? Yeah, yeah that, was, that was my question. Yeah, so I have a background on all that. Another question that I had was, I'm sure you run scenarios through your head of a domestic nuclear detonation. Yeah. So, Which is a wild one. It, it's pretty insane. I was talking to somebody actually today at lunch, Dave Bowers actually, when I was having uh, okay. lunch with him. And he's like, so who you talking to today? And I told him, and I was like, he goes, what's his job? I told him, you know, what you do, you instruct that stuff. And he's just like, man, you couldn't get more specific if you tried. I'm like, I know. So... <laughs> Let's go ahead and explain what would be a scenario where this happens and obviously local um, authorities, police, fire, obviously first to the scene, if not involved directly in the scene with casualties, you know, God forbid, obviously, right? casualties and injuries. Uh, what would be a stand or what would be the basic steps that go through your mind if something like that were to happen? God forbid it happens, but what are the basic steps, the beginning steps of the stages? Well, interestingly enough, a book that you can read that was very influential, by by the way, this is what my research at the Naval Postgraduate School was on. Again, um, I specifically, so I, I, I focused specifically on urban search and rescue after a domestic nuclear detonation in regards to the CREE, the Seaburn Response Enterprise, my enterprise. What, what could we do better to be better support people in terms of urban search and rescue? And then the article that I just published in the uh, U.S. Army Nuclear Encountering WMD Agencies, Countering WMD Journal, took a piece of that because I felt that there, there was a chapter in the thesis where I specifically talked about what it takes or, or start, I, I, I don't want to say by any means defined it, because I'm not a physicist, I'm not a scientist, and so there's many elements to this I feel like I could be missing, or that there, or like any good research, I recognize that there's more that can be done, more research to be done. But what I, what I tried to do was begin to characterize what the urban search and rescue problem would look like after a nuclear detonation in the United States. And a, a huge source of inspiration, and because that requires, it's never happened, right? Like there's... We can talk about what does what does urban search and rescue look like after a hurricane. Well, everybody can tell you that because the FEMA USAR system does this every year. Now I can tell you what it would look like if a big tornado hit the state of Kentucky, right? Because I, I was there, and that's that's something that frequently happens. Tornadoes happen in, in in the United States that are catastrophic and create those problems. It's not a novel event, but a domestic nuclear detonation is a novel event. It's something that's never happened, and so it requires an almost an element of imagination to try to think about what that would look like. And how that event would unfold. It's never happened. So everything, everything that we have in mind about how we think this is going to go is imaginatory. It's, it, is that so a word? what's your best imagination? <laughs> imagination. Is imaginatory a word? Uh, Did I just make that up? It, maybe. I like but it. It's I'm like gonna, a I'm going to run with it. It's okay. So, yeah. But what would be your imagination? Because I can imagine what can happen. Sure. I can, I can, I've got all sorts of crazy ideas of what would happen. Right. But what is your imagination of what happening and then the next steps prevailing after that? Basic stuff. I mean, right. Is, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's like asking some like uh, a, a basic level artist to try to like describe one of Picasso's works. Right. It's like it's like this huge, massive event that no one's ever thought of. So what I was getting at was that Tom Clancy's The Sum of All Fears was a book that was a major source of inspiration for me. And it's a work of fiction. Right. It, it's, it's, it's a story. It's a made up novel. But that imaginative process that Tom Clancy used helped get me going, and he actually talks about it a little bit. And so uh, that's a book that I would encourage anybody who's kind of curious of what that might look like to pick up. Even though it's a very brief window of the book, the whole book is based around a improvised nuclear device that is planted during the Super Bowl in Denver, Colorado, and detonates 
and causes the United States and Russia to go at each other's throats because there's bad information shared about the characterization of it. And, of course, the, the hero, Dr. Jack Ryan, come, swoops in and, and, and saves the day at the last minute. He's the uh, deputy director of the CIA in the book and, and, he, and in the series. And he comes in and, and he's, he, he's able to, to save the day. But that, that is a very good, in my opinion, as far as authors who've, who've kind of thought about this, which is actually a very narrow subset, surprisingly, not, su- not surprisingly. Uh, but that's a very good picture of what, to at least start thinking about it. I can tell you through my research what I think it's going to look like is chaos. It's going to look like 9-11 on steroids, unfortunately. Specifically, my research suggests that, and again, this is all largely dependent upon the type of device that is used. Uh, there's so many variables. The, the, the type, the yield, which is basically another way of saying the energy that it puts out, right? And, and, and it's worth mentioning that the Cree was all born out of this idea of the suitcase nuke and really kind of goes back to 2005. And, and even even before that, uh, you know, Senator Luger from here in Indiana was very instrumental in some of this stuff. And, and he kind of saw WMD as the future when, when he was alive and in office. Um, but you could be talking about a device like that, an improvised nuclear device that's the suitcase nuke, which I think is, is kind of gone away as far as what's on our radar all the way up to an actual nuclear strike by a foreign power, by Russia, by China. Now we even have to worry about Iran and North Korea, and even a strong argument can be made that we're at a greater risk of a nuclear strike, a domestic nuclear attack now than we were back then when all this was thought up because of uh, the the reemergence of great power competition and some of these uh, I don't want to say rogue states, but regional powers like Iran and, and North Korea you can qual- certainly qualifies as a rogue state that are playing in the nuclear enterprise now. So a lot of it's dependent upon a, 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 a variety of factors. However, I, I do know this. There's going to be a lot of fire. Now, I say that. Scientists even disagree upon upon that. Uh, and there's a very good book written about it called Whole, Whole World on Fire by Lynn Eden that, that kind of talks about that. But I am convinced from the research that fire will be a factor because as firefighters, we know that in any structural collapse event, fire is a problem. Look at the World Trade Center. Look at what uh, even work had to be paused for some time in Miami after that collapse because you have natural fire hazards. You have gas lines broken. You have you know, uh, electric hazards, things like that that naturally cause fires and structural collapse events. And then there's also the potential for this phenomenon called nuclear firestorm to occur, which basically the nuclear event creates its own insulated weather pattern of fire, which is wild to say and even think about, but it's a possibility. Now, will that, will that manifest in a smaller nuclear detonation? Nobody really agrees upon that. And there's a lot of research, especially because, right, if an, if an event like this happens, it's probably going to be targeting a major city like New York City, and there's modeling that suggests the buildings will insulate different effects of the, of the, the detonation, and, and it will prevent some of those fire effects from propagating. But what I can tell you as somebody who's been a firefighter and worked at structure collapse events, that even in the absence of a firestorm event, fire is going to be a problem. It's a problem in any collapse event, and that's going to be a major collapse event. So there's going to be fire, and it's going to take a lot of people to solve this problem because you're going to have nuclear fallout. It, it kind of begins to, when you examine this problem from a response and a planning point of view, it starts to play in this intersection of urban search and rescue or technical rescue and hazmat stuff or seaburn stuff. It's kind of where those two meet because now we have technical rescue problem meeting the nuclear fallout, which is a hazmat and seaburn problem. And we're putting them together in the same place. And so now we have to be operating under the principles of both, which a strong argument can be made. We should be doing that anyways. We're kind of already doing that in the FEMA USAR system, right? We realize that when we go out on these flood events, most water is contaminated at these events. And so it's by proxy, it's automatically a hazmat event too. But it's not something we think about a lot. So it, you're going to have the nuclear fallout issue. That is going to obviously bring with it the radiation hazard and the both the contamination and the exposure problem. 
And so you're going to have to be rotating people out to keep their well, even, sorry exposure low. No, please but, do. But even with the nuclear fallout, especially if there's like an electrical EMP, electrical... Uh, electromagnetic pulse. Electromagnetic pulse that could take out the radio communication systems. Yes. What would be... Like, what are, what are other options to communicate with other entities, agencies? Boy, that's a tough other problem. Than, other than sat phones. Would well, a sat phone still work at that point? You know, so here's the thing. I'm not, EMP is something that is, that I would love to look at more. Just because I'm, I am admittedly very limited in the realm of my research because I'm not a physical scientist. And that's so why I struggle with some of this sometimes, admittedly. And if anybody's listening to this and they're like, hey, I have a background in physics and could really help that guy out, please, I could use your help. Um, EMP is something that I know is a problem. It just feels so far out of my reach that I have not dedicated a lot of time considering it or, or researching that realm. But you really consider reading Tom Clancy's The Sum of All Fears because, it, and I, it, again, this is novel. This is, it is a novel. This, it, it doesn't mean this is what would happen. It's just somebody what ifing it. But a very interesting event happens in The Sum of All Fears where when the device detonates, he, so they, they use a, a, what they paint up to look like a, a news van. That's what they have the device in. And so they plan it around these other news trucks. And when the device goes off, it, emi- it emits energy that be, you know, at, at, at an, in, an increasingly accelerated speed, faster than the detonation occurs. But before the detonation destroys the trucks around it, the energy actually hits the satellite on the trucks and transmits or reflects that, and I could be saying that wrong, that energy to the satellites in space and shuts down all, it it, it transmits that energy from that satellite and to the satellite, or from that satellite dish to the satellites it's communicating with in orbit and shuts down all TV networks across the United States and, and parts of the country, or parts of the world, I'm sorry. So that's like an interesting problem that I had never, again, that's the value of imaginative literature when you're thinking about novel problems like that. Video games. Absolutely. So war gaming is huge right now. Video games, I I know that I get made fun of at work when I talk about it all the time, but there's actual video games out there that you can play that are about the end of the world and stuff like that, nuclear fallout, fallout. The nuclear fallout with having no no cellular communication, no communication at all, other than just verbally. Do we go back to smoke signals? No. But <laughs> what's going to be happening? So, with that, that's well. It's, it's interesting a, it's you bring that up because it's got to be dramatic. No, it's still, good. There are aspects into that kind of stuff. Yes, that you yeah. can learn from. And be like, you know, I never because it's obviously it hasn't happened. Obviously, could it happen? Yes, it would be terrifying if it did. I don't know what I would do. I mean, I'm by far not a huge prepper by any means but it makes you think which is what i love to do is is like man what would i do in this situation i i don't know and obviously i work on a fire department so yeah i'm trying to think in my position if something were to happen in the uh the general vicinity obviously if i'm outside of the the blast radius zone or if i'm outside of the uh uh the yield that's the word you used earlier, the yield from the power of the explosion. You know, how many how many agencies am I thinking about? Are we going to be, I'm not obviously going to be the one doing the, the scene size of first. Well, it's, 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 it's an interesting. But how many agencies uh, yeah. are going to be involved in this? Fire departments. How many fire departments are going to be involved in this? How many police departments and sheriff's departments? And then you're going to have the federal com- federals coming in. And command zone. Where are we setting the command zone up? Obviously, that's. Depending on where it happens at, you would have uh, a command zone set up and a downwind. Are we how many, how a quarter mile, two miles, three miles? Depending on the like Chernobyl, you, you'd have to be tens mi- tens of miles out, and that's where your command zone's at. You, can you get eyes on it? Can we see anything? I no. Go I, to nukemap dot com. The guy's brilliant. He has a PhD from I want to say, say that one more Harvard. Nukemap. Nukemap dot com, okay. and you can actually simulate a nuclear detonation. You can play with the device. You can, when I say play with the device, you can manipulate what type of device, the yield of the device, if it's an air burst or surface blast. Do we need to let her out? No, she's good. She's good. I think so. We got the dog here. Yeah. That was one of my. Uh, that was one of my sticking points. The dog had to hang out. 
He um, should be all right for now. Yeah, okay. Just wanting some attention. Oh. If he has one to see the dog, actually. Hey, you should. I'll hold her yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Show him the dog. Let me make sure this is not some sort of. You want to say hi? <laughs> say hello. <laughs> Look at it. She's the best dog, man. That's why. She is so sweet and so loving <laughs> and so friendly. She's she's been um, sleeping over here on my feet half half yeah, the time. She's she's so great, dude. She's a rescue. That's what you told me. Yeah, she which is tied, interesting. She's tied up to a basketball goal on Speedway. Poor girl. Oh, she's such a good dog. She's my best friend, except for my wife. My wife's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Uh, all right. So go, sorry. Go no, you're good. You're talking, about. you're talking about the game nukemap.com. Oh, um, nukemap.com. The gentleman who published it or runs it has a PhD from Harvard, I want to say, having something to do with the history of technology, but he specialized in the history of nuclear weapons, and he, he runs a really cool blog about nuclear secrecy, and one of his projects is, is nukemap.com, and you can go on there and you can simulate anywhere on a map a nuclear detonation. And so from that, he gives a prediction of, and you can manipulate the weather and, and, and all these different factors and, and get an idea, a model, of what the different zones would be as far as damage, because usually in, in such an event we talk about uh, high, moderate, and low damage zones, and mm-hmm. then, then he gives uh, r- predicted radiation levels at certain uh, intervals and the predicted path of the fallout and all these different things. And so it, you can you can play with this thing. And one thing that I actually did was simulate. Bec- so the Super Bowl obviously happened here. When, what year was that? Ooh. It's been a while now. It's been a while. I was it been, has it been ten around ten years? I think over Little, ten years. Well, it could be. About I was 10 an EMT years. at Seals Ambulance at the time. That's all. I was in paramedic school, so it had to have been 2012. I'll look it up. Um, but obviously, that's something that happened here and was a major target. And so, most folks don't know that the Department of Energy's nuclear emergency search team was here, searching for potential nuclear devices in preparation for that event. And so, just for the novelty of it, I, I've gone on Nuke Map and I've simulated different devices occurring around Lucas Oil Stadium. What I can tell you from doing that is, as a Greenwood firefighter, just go ahead and expect you're going you're gonna to be responding there. I mean, you're, out, you're just out of that radius. And like you said, it's going to take so many resources. So these agencies like Greenwood and, uh, I don't know, Fishers, Carmel, Brownsburg, any, all the surrounding, all the, uh, in the donut counties, uh, all these agencies, you know, they're going to be needed and heavily relied upon in an event like that. And and then some, right, because you just mentioned all the federal assets that are going to come in. And I mentioned my, my enterprise and the military assets that are going to try to come help. So, yeah, huge undertaking. February 5th, 2012. Is that that one away? That was, yeah, the game was played on February 20, uh, okay. February 5th, 2012, yeah. yeah, at Lucas Oil. And, and like I said, Nest was here. They were here doing a sweep. I, I'm sure. And so I played with that. That's really cool. I, yeah. When I I went to the uh, one of the nights that they had the parties there and stuff, I'm not a big huge sports fan. If anybody knows me, uh, um, me neither. Yeah, ask me who the quarterback of the Colts sporting. is. Sporting, yeah. As I, a, a good friend of mine, Jeremy Yerke, no, says, "Sporting, what is sporting? It is a sporting event." <laughs> it, um, but we went, and I was trying to imagine like how many different government agencies and police and fire first responders are here right now working, not just hanging out, having fun, working. I spoke with a uh, Johnson County Sheriff deputy. His name's DJ. He's one of our very good friends. And he, one of his jobs, one of the nights was basically walking celebrities yeah. from their cars to the hotel all night long, just meeting celebrities that were coming in town. And he just walked them back and forth. And he had so many, there's so many different members just alone on just the normal night there for the Super Bowl. Then add in a nuclear detonation, yeah, or even a, a terrorist attack of any kind, you, right? I would assume that it would you would your entities would need to double immediately, just throw people at it. Obviously, investigate and and try to figure out what what it is, what you're going to need, what what are your um, uh, I'm sorry, what are you going to need? Where are you going to need them to stage at? Right? How many how many occupants? Uh, how many victims do we have? Uh, where where possibly is there going to be a second attack? There's always this second uh, devices that are always worried about. 
And there's just so much that is involved in thinking that. I guarantee you they had to have had plans if, like, I'm sure that these people that were that were in charge of this were like, hey, if something happens here, <coughs> this is where you can also mute your mic, too. Oh, you good to know. Yeah, so the right whole the button. audience doesn't have to hear me coughing yeah, into the mic. The green button, you press that, oh, it turns red, and, and then it turns back green whenever you change it back. But I'm sure that they had some pretty good ideas of what to do and where to do it. But but still, it's just it's a it seems like a logistical nightmare. Well, think about what you're you're about. pointing at is all the moving parts. Think about all the moving parts. I'm petting the dog, by the way. <laughs> Think about all the moving parts in this. It's such a complex thing. And then on top of that, like I said, or we discussed, it's a novel thing. It's something that's never happened before. And so we're trying to anticipate the characterization of something that's never happened before. It's, it's almost inconceivable in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's so many. And, and then even beyond that, think about it beyond just the response agencies, right? Because it at some point we're going to have to recover and try to get back to normal in this area or, you know, are we like, what, what are we going to do? I think of all the different layers of the bureaucracy involved in that. And, you know, if it, you look at the, I'll, I'll bring up two things. Let's bring up uh nine 11 real quick. If you look at, I remember going to the airport with my sister because she went to New York city uh, a few months before the attacks uh, on the world trade center. I believe it was a few months. It was a school trip. I remember walking into an airport. Now, I was very young. I remember walking into that airport and walking all the way through to your gate. Yeah. And my parents, remember t- I remember them telling me that as well. You were able just to walk straight through. No security, hardly at all, if, if any. Any types of checks to make sure, hey, you're not carrying a weapon. You, I mean, all sorts of stuff that the security afterwards. Is it on? It is, uh, I think. Um, is it green? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Um, the security checks now that afterwards that still continue on to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not sure about the liquid stuff. Like you can't have any more than what four or six ounces of liquid in a bottle or something. Yeah. But I don't know if that came from that or after that, or even if it was before that. But the stuff that is still continued today, and then also look at you know, you know, COVID. What has changed now from two years ago to now, and that will remain most likely for the remainder of the next, I don't know. Who knows? Five, 10, 20, 30, 40, or longer. forever years. Yeah. Maybe, you know, in three years it might change. But I think if you would just, if you were to see something like that, you would see an, an enormous change in not only just the culture of the American people, but in politics. Oh, well, I mean. And safety yeah. and local entities and what they can handle. Just like with, uh, I, I talked to guys that were on the fire department's, during the 9-11 attack, they, I remember them talking about there was government money that was coming around, uh, federal grants, that you were getting a lot of hazmat stuff. Uh, one of our hazmat units was the cause of that. And then all the equipment, all of the equipment, the expensive qu- equipment that guys, that departments, not guys, departments have had for 20 years now, that they're going to have to keep replacing that. Yes. And, and it's going to get outdated. It's definitely outdated. It's going to get expensive. It's good parts are going to get you know dry rotted and break or wh- what have you. But that's just that's more cost that is going to be onto that that department. That that's have the to very interesting. Unless problem. you're getting more federal grants. Unless you're getting more money. Unless more money's flowing and, in. And I, I, let's let's go ahead and think about this real quick. Um, is it beneficial to keep? that equipment around if it hasn't happened in 20 years? That's a very good question. What do, what do you want to be prepared for and what do you not want to be prepared for? Because every good every good fireman will say you need to plan for the, uh, what is it, expect the unexpected sure. and plan for everything. Yeah, what, we, was got plenty, we got Guys always say, I'll see you on the big one, right? We're, yeah. all, we're always trying to anticipate that next big event. Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. Here's what I can say immediately and this is actually something i've i've thought about writing about because i think a lot of folks are thinking along the same lines that you are i know i certainly have we have shifted from a national security point of view from a policy level we have shifted away from being so concerned about terrorism to being concerned about what we call great power competition 
right? It's actually, I think it's the it's either the national defense strategy or the national security strategy. Now, now it it it, impl- it explicitly says in the fine print, we are shifting to be concerned about great power competition. So, what is great power competition? That's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, peers and near peers, and regional powers who are all competing for global dominance with us. Right? That's the, so we've shifted as a national security community to be focused on that. We're not saying terrorism is not a thing anymore, but we're shifting our emphasis. Well, what does that mean for the fire service? What does that mean for, because like you said, like you just pointed out, after 9-11, the messaging was very clear that we as the fire service or as, as any local and state, state and local level response agencies, we had a role in solving the problem. We're trying to solve the problem. We're trying to be prepared. And that was Hazmat and Seaburn and MCI and some of these, you know, even the technical rescue and USAR disciplines. Uh, it was just, it was very clear where, that we had a place. Like you said, that was kind of where the, the, or was the impetus for Greenwood having their hazmat truck. That's a, that's a perfect example of that. There, it was clear what role the Greenwood Fire Department could play in addressing this problem. But now that we've shifted away from terrorism and put our focus on power competition, that begs the question, well, do we have a role to play? And what is that role, right? I, and I, that kind of feeds right into what you're getting, getting to is, okay, all this stuff sitting around, are we just not doing this anymore? What, what are we supposed to be doing over here? And if there is another fight going on, how can we be involved? What can we do for you? And interestingly enough, I, I posed that question in very much that same way at the joint, I think it was called the Joint Civil and DOD Seaburn Conference that happened in National Harbor, Maryland a few months ago. I proposed or, or put that question out there in much that same manner to some folks that are very high in the DOD and said, okay, you're not worried about terrorism as much anymore. What's our, what's our place? What's our role? The, you know, you have your, it's the joint civil and DOD Seaburn conference. So obviously the idea here is to get together lo- state and locals over here and federal government and military officials over here, bring them together and let's talk about this problem and, and, and link up and, and not repeat the, the failures of communication that led into 9-11. But you're still not, now you're not telling us what you need from us. Now you, you just told us you've shifted your focus. One thing that he put back on me in his response was, well, I think you need to consider the role of reverse DISCA. What's, divi- what's DISCA? Well, DISCA is what I said I do earlier. Defense support of civil authorities, the government, the, the federal government helping the state and locals in time of disaster, and he kind of opened my eyes to the fact that there's there can be this thing or this concept of reverse DISCA, where we as the locals are supporting the federal government and the, and and the greater national effort or the greater national security effort, which, as you and I kind of talked about, has kind of been the driving force behind what I'm trying to do with my career. But th- there there is this idea that can be born that is reverse DISCA and we can do things on the ground here to support the federal government in a peer fight with China, Russia, um, or with a rogue nation like North, North Korea or Iran. Uh, they kind of are on the board. They're a regional power. But anyways, we do have a role we can play. And, and an example he gave was medical support, hospital support. You know, obviously if we go to war with a major power, there's going to be a lot of casualties and it might overwhelm the Department of Defenses and even uh, the Department of Health and Human Services abilities to care for those casualties. And so maybe we have medically trained people. Maybe we can use those folks to help take care of soldiers when they return or injured soldiers or some kind of somehow be supportive that way. And he's like, that's an idea maybe you could think about. Uh, but I think it really kind of gets w- what he said, his response, the spirit of, uh, of his response was kind of invoking what uh, President Kennedy said, right? And I'm sure I'll butcher it, but what was it? Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Mm-hmm. That was kind of the, na- the, the, the feeling that I got from his response. So have I really answered the question, what can we do? Well, I gave an idea. I think, I think we need to be looking into the, into the future and asking what we can do to be supportive. One thing I will throw out 
where I think we need to be doing a better job as the fire service is the intelligence community. And we, we interestingly, that's something you like to talk about, but intelligence collection. And I don't want to butcher the story too badly, but, uh, you know, I think something I'd shared with you when we were texting back and forth was the story about the uh, gentleman from FDNY who was in my cohort at NPS. And he tells a story about another New York City fire officer who worked around the UN in New York. And he made a run, a run, I think it was during the UN General Assembly. There was a man stuck in an elevator. And this man was in a big, he, he, he was, um, it turns out he was Korean and he was in a hurry, to, big hurry to get out of that elevator. And when they finally get him out, somehow an exchange of words happen or a conversation happens along the lines of the officer asking why he's in such a hurry. And he mumbles something to the effect of, I have to let them know that our supreme leader has died. Now, I'm probably butchering that story, and the gentleman who told the story, I don't want to dime him out here in front of everybody, but he, he can hit me up later and tell me how I butchered it. But um, the moral of that story was that fire officer became the first person, probably the first person in the Western world, to learn of the leader of North Korea's death. You would think that's a piece of info. That's a very valuable piece of information for our national security community. But, of course, it was never passed along. And so that things like that are, are you know, we're out, we're out here on the ground. We're eyes and ears, and the British actually do a, a tremendously good job of that, of making local responders their eyes and ears for the, the greater uh, intelligence community. That's something I think that we could be contributing here in that regard. Um, you know, there, the, I think it was the Houston Fire Department recently that's, that responded to the Chinese embassy when they were ordered shut down, and the Chinese were burning documents. Mm-hmm. What a great... Just going into that building, what a great opportunity to collect intelligence is vital to our national security. But is there an avenue for that information to be shared? I'm looking it up on my phone to just kind of make sure that we're talking about the right subject. Yeah. Uh, and it says, uh, I typed in Chinese Embassy Houston, and it goes permanently closed. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> no more. But that's what happened, right? Mm-hmm. And so I don't know, I would, if anybody happened to listen to this who was involved in that response, I would love to talk to them. That would be very cool. That would be very cool to see. Um, it never looks good when you start burning and deleting your documents. <laughs> well, to be like fair, it, we would do the same. We would do the oh, same. If I'm we sure, abandon an embassy, sure. the thing's like, got to go. But me thinking as a, uh, like a normal guy, I'm just a normal dude. And I hear that the cop, the cops are on their way here. <laughs> I better burn everything. I got to get rid of all my stuff, all my shit that I got. I, I got to start burning. <laughs> what am I hiding? Well, to like, be, I mean, to be fair, that'd be like, we, like I said, we drugs. would do the same thing. There, there's yeah. information in the, you know, di- diplomatic communications are very secure, and it's vital to the national interests of whatever country is, is operating out of that embassy. And so we would absolutely do the same, and and oh, yeah. we absolutely did the same in Vietnam when we abandoned our embassy in Saigon, right? You to know? the layman's guy like me, it looks bad. I guarantee we were the, the same thing was happening in Afghanistan when they got the uh, the order to get out of there. But you know, people were throwing things in the incinerator. So uh, we would do the same. To be fair, but so but with that being said, what about the guy that's getting arrested for drug charges <laughs> and he's eating the drugs? <laughs> he's just trying to get. He's just doing the same thing that our <laughs> is that the defense that's going to be invoked now? I'm just <laughs> man, I'm just getting rid of these documents like you did. No, we've talked about this before the other day. Obviously, there are differences of accountability for Absolutely. certain things. There are certain positions of we talked about this. I think we before we recorded it the day before. We won't get into the details. Uh, well, we we could. It was the Ashley Babbitt thing. Yes, it was. We talked about that officer that did shoot. Ashley Babbitt over at the Capitol building. Yes. And then if you have the officer just as recently, she was obviously fired. And then I believe she's facing prison time for accidentally pulling out her pistol instead of her taser. And she shot and uh, I believe she killed that uh, young man that was trying to drive away. Um, but there was just a difference in my eyes. In my eyes, I see there's a difference of accountability. We're, we're treating one thing differently than the other. And we we did talk about that for a bit, and you you did give a pretty reasonable explanation on that. If you want to quickly dive into that, then we can go right back into central intelligence, unless yeah. you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I do feel somewhat qualified to answer that question, just because of the exposure I have had to federal law enforcement and working with some of those those folks. And so, yes, we were talking about that. We were we had a, like our own little miniature debate going, and 
And what I pushed back on was, of, of my knowledge of protective operations and, and law enforcement when they're operating in a protective role, specifically at that federal level, it's not, it, it, you're, for lack of a better way of saying it, you're playing under a different set of rules when you are protecting a dignitary than when you are out looking for crime. And so I have actually ran this a buy. Again, I, I'm not necessarily an expert in this, and that's why I'm careful in what I say, but I have spoken to folks that I do consider expert experts and would absolutely take their opinion for it and feel no problem with, with repeating it, is that everything I just said, and that officer, he drew a line in the sand behind that window and said, okay, my dignitaries that I have to protect are back here. As long as the crowd stays beyond that line in the sand that I've drawn, and I my weapon's drawn, I'm making it be known, as long as they stay on that line of the sand, we're fine. But as the moment that line in the sand is crossed, then I have to take action. And that's what happened, in my professional opinion, and in the research that I've done. And I, th I think that is Well, they is did justified. an internal uh, investigation on it, and whenever... I see. Oh, sorry. I keep. I oh, you're fine. Change it on me. I'm just trying whenever to pay attention see, to the dog too. Oh yeah. Whenever I see a, a department or entity do an internal investigation, I'm. I know how humans respond to a lot of things, and if things look bad on them, they'll try to. Because I don't even believe they came out with who the officer was. That did shoot and kill. Uh, actually, I think they did. Did they? I think they did. Okay, then I missed. But I again, missed this that this part. is so far beyond what, my realm that I, yeah. now I'm, you, I at this point you're you're asking me questions that I I, I don't feel that I'm qualified it, it. <laughs> to answer. But but well, again, I, I do have uh, I have worked in protective operations to some very small degree, and, and 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 within the level that I feel comfortable making a, a statement or a judgment. That's it. I don't even want you looking it up. I typed in. Well, listen, you know what happened video. the other day when we started I know. Uh, throwing names around, man. It don't even it don't even pull up. Usually, it pulls right on up once you uh, you look into it. I bet you this uh will get shut down again one more time. Right, right. Uno mosh. Um, no, but once you do like it, we're gonna do an internal investigation on uh, who the the uh, culprit is on this. And oh, we we couldn't find anything. It's that's how I felt like it's it went. That's how I felt like it went. So, so what do you? you do, well, then let me ask you this because it's it's yeah. a, it's an equally controversial topic. Is then as somebody who studied homeland security for a year yeah. and a half, ethics, morals, and accountability was a huge piece of what we discussed while I was at MPS, and that's what I think makes it such a or one of the things, one of the very many things that makes that program so great, is they put such an emphasis on, again, morals, ethics. And the responsibility of homeland security professionals to hold each other accountable and hold hold the profession accountable and and make sure that our pursuits are noble and constitutional and with the the best interest of the citizenry in mind. I'm glad I didn't butcher that one. I was That's good. That one. Uh, um, well, now I forgot where I, where were we going with this. Well, I'm not gonna lie to you right now. Did you it forget? Is, no, I didn't. Oh, forget. we're talking about accountability. It's, no, it's so not, it's not even pulling up on my phone. It's like not. I, I'm typing it. I've typed it in on, on uh, Google, and it won't even show up. It says I'm offline, but I'm clearly online. And then maybe we'll get shut down again. <laughs> well, we might. Okay, now I got accountability it. is a huge, a huge thing yeah. that we discuss, and so it's tough, right? And so the the question I guess I would throw back to you is: I I feel like there's mixed feelings about the role of civilian accountability boards over law, not just law enforcement, but other government agencies. So what do you think the role is of, of civilian within the realm of what's appropriate for me to discuss? What do you feel is the role of um, civilian accountability outlets in public safety? Should the fire department have civilian accountability and oversight? Wow, that's a controversial topic. That'll that's get you some hate mail. That'll get you some hate mail. Oh, it'll get me uh, looked at. <laughs> it'll but, get me looked at. By the way, uh, it, but it's just it, a question. It, it didn't come out. Question. It was uh, Lieutenant Michael Bird, is what their investigation says. Okay, is it true? Hmm, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but, um, do the fire departments have 
accountability. So basically, like a. Well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, you know, we're 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 playing mental tennis here, right? I'm just yeah. kicking the question back and saying, okay, you obviously accountability for in what. Well, just like you said, you felt like when agencies audit themselves or do an internal investigation, you feel that 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 uh, that fact alone could potentially discredit the um, truthfulness of or reliability of the yeah. investigation. I truly believe that it can. So the reason why is because if you have, if I was the leader of an organization and we had some stuff go down, what would I want for an investigation? Me personally. I'd want an outside entity to come in to make sure that they know that I am not biased by anything. Sure, I don't. I don't think and you're if wrong. the truth the truth needs to come out anyways. I, what, what am I going to do? Sit there and lie, and say, uh, "Well, this is what happened," because I'm sure there are places where things did happen and people were protected, and they got what they wanted and they didn't get their pee pee smacked. I'm sure there's plenty of places like that, and it it let it it gets let it gets. Pushed under the rug, and it, oh. it's allowed to happen. Well, so I, but what so I'm, but what I'm kicking back is, where does that ca- accountability need to come from? Is it, is it the, is it civilian accountability boards? Is it from outside agencies? If you know, is that trust? It, it, does that meet your mm-hmm. metric of trust? And, and point, does the fire department need it? At that point, if if it's a civilian entity that comes in, you can, depending on who. Who's going to put that board together of the civilian people that are going to come together to do those audits? Who puts them together? Is it the mayor that puts it together? Is it the governor that puts it together? Is it going to be the fire chief that puts it together? And if so, is it going to be his buddies? Or is it going to be people that are in line with him or that he's got, you know, strength over that says, hey, I want you to kind of have this kind of uh, outlook on it. You see how complex this gets very quickly? It's very complex. But it's still, it does it. It does no harm to ask the question. No, absolutely. No, we should be asking these and questions. And there's a lot of places like are are the departments as a whole held accountable, especially for uh, civilian care. Is sorry. Oh, that's yours. Not mine. Is it me? Yeah. It's all right. Spam. No, fuck it. Um, are even a lot of departments held accountable? There, you'll see stories in the news every once in a while of uh, a fireman or even a fire chief treating. A civilian extremely poorly. Right. It's rare. It's it's not as it's not as uh, media driven as if a police officer is having a. I'm not saying every cop that's beating up somebody that shouldn't be doing that shouldn't be violated is having just a bad day. They could just be an asshole cop because there are plenty of those. There's plenty of bad apples in the police force, but there's sure. also plenty of bad apples in the fire department as well. There's the discussion. We can have a whole series of discussions of what creates somebody with a bad attitude and why do we keep them there? Sure. Because not everybody gets removed. Well, the bad it, apples it, don't get picked. I, you know, I think out. this flows into the conversation that you and I had the other day about the role of politics and all this. And I think I had made the statement, I know I certainly made it earlier, that, and, and I made it when I was at NPS, that Politics gets uh, the the word itself gets a bad rap in our li- in our our lingo and our um, our lexicon American lexicon Western lexicon it's it's popular almost to say I don't like politicians and I in in my both my professional opinion and my humble opinion as as a citizen I think that other citizens tend to use that almost as a cop out. Because I see it from a very man in the arena perspective, politics, although it's easy, it's it's both easy and popular, and sometimes even w- relieving to knock on. It, it it is what empowers the citizenry to have a say in how they are governed. And while yes, a lot of the attention does get placed on the police department in that regard, the fire department is the government, and as such. The, the citizens have a say in how their fire protection works, and politics is that outlet. And so, again, I think it flows right into that conversation you and I were having about the role of politics in the fire service and in all this. And, and again, I think it's a cop-out that we as a society often like to bash politics, but Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to lead. And politics is the outlet that we have as citizens to have a say in how we're governed.
which again is infinitely complex. And right now it's, it's terribly polar. And, and we can even get into that like we did the other day about the dangers of, of where I think we are right now politically and in the political environment. But without jumping off into another rabbit hole without solving one, um, I, think, I think what you're saying brings up an, 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 at least an important point about the role of politics and the fire service. Because we were even talking about the role of like, we were talking about what makes a good fire chief. And I had made the point that, well, to some degree, the fire chief is a political position because he has to answer to the mayor. Or at least he has to play in both worlds. He has to straddle the line, right? He's that buffer between the political figure, the, the ultimate political, fi- political figure, who's the mayor, and then... The, the the fire chief or the fire officers and firefighters, right? He, he he so he has to be cognizant of both worlds and play in both worlds. And so again, the being a fire chief is very much has a political dynamic to it. And so when we contemplate, when we were having our conversation about what makes a good fire chief, I brought up that I felt that the ability to how do I say this? I don't want to say be a politician, but to manage operating in that world effectively is a very important piece in my opinion what what do you got on that because we, we we had a great discussion about that well, sadly i don't remember what i said but <laughs> i didn't is, mean to put you on the spot no no it's perfectly fine um honestly the i remember the the answer i gave was somewhat somewhat along the lines of um obviously not a fire chief i i don't think i'm fire, fire chief neither neither am i I couldn't do that job. I can only imagine what they do. I've only worked under a, a couple fire chiefs. There's obviously things that there's things that you'll like and dislike about each person you work for. Everybody, everybody, you will never like somebody 100% because for one, that is insane. If you like somebody that you work for 100%, no matter what, every decision you make, you love it. You love it. Love it. That's insane. You need to have, the disagreements, the differences of opinions. That's what makes forcing diversity, I think, is a is an issue, but letting it happen naturally, I think, is a fantastic thing. But you need diverse thought. Absolutely. You need somebody with a difference of opinion coming in saying, hey, this is how I was raised. This is how I learned what to do in a leadership role, either military or somebody even from another country on – Hey, this is what I learned while I was here. This is um, a different way of a team building exercise that I learned whilst being military in the school or wh- whatever they had. The position that I would think what would make a good fire chief is somebody that holds the morals of, this is my personal opinion, sure. uh, strong belief in God. Somebody who holds okay. true with what the Bible talks about. We talked about this a lot in the last episode. You say <laughs> the last, last episode. episode. The, the, the That's the ghost episode. I say from yeah. now on we refer to that as the, the ghost episode. It is the episode that yeah. was but never was. Correct. Um, the, epi- the one that we did the other day, we talked a lot about a lot of the stuff in the Bible, what it talks about. People think that it's just some type of a weird cre- uh, crackpot book. I find it to be an extremely good leadership book. You can learn so much about interpersonal communications. You can talk about psychology. You talk anything, any topic that you that are having an issue with. There is something in that book that you can find. Well, what remember something what I said? Remember, I, you I know, don't remember what you said. I was reading, um, I was rereading Dale Carnegie's "How to Win Friends and Influence yes. Pe- okay, People," I that now. and I had this epiphany. It's like, wow. Because regardless of what you think, the and this was told to me by a, a, a military officer. He said, regardless of your religious opinion, I know military commanders that read the Bible because it's a manual on war, or at least the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament, it is a manual on war. And then as I was reading Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, it, I, it just struck me. I was like, he's repeating a lot of what is said in the New Testament. The New Testament is more or less a manual for diplomacy. And then it really hit me. I was like, wow, the New Testament is a manual for diplomacy and the Old Testament is a manual for war. There you have war and peace in one book. I don't know. I, I don't know why, but that just maybe it's just because I'm a nerd or because I'm, I'm a, a foreign affairs and a policy nerd. But 
that just struck me as wild, like how that dichotomy even exists there in a work like the Bible, that war and peace. And, and I would agree with you 100% that there are leadership lessons. Because like I said, you, I could see the parallels. And again, that we're talking about diversity here. That's just a reflection of my background because I grew up in a Christian home. So that's my background speaking. But I was able to recognize that pattern and that overlay, and it, it just struck me as wild that, wow, you have a manual for both war and peace, that dichotomy right there in in this history book alone. Uh, because this is ultimately what the Bible is. It, it is a, it's a history book, and that's why, like, you know, and I think it was even might have been former Secretary of Defense James Mattis who brought, brings that up. I, I, I could be wrong, but I feel like he brings that up at some point in his book or in something I've heard him say about how, um, that's what that that is what the Bible contributed to his military. I don't want to say success, but to his, the way he operated militarily, it's just interesting. It's interesting to think of the Bible as a political work, right? Because that's what war is. War is armed There's politics. There's definitely a lot of politics in the Bible. Well, but war is, is armed yeah. politics. But war is also the, the war or. or Politics exists on a scale from diplomacy on one end to war on the other, right? Wars aren't politics, but we prefer to stay over here in diplomacy when we can. And so anytime you're bringing those two together, that's politics. And that's so it, it, it's almost novel, I think, to think of a work like the Bible in a political sense. But it very much is. It's about having relationships with other people, just like you're saying. So, yeah, it's just. It, it, it's it, it's wild to me to think of it in that context, but I believe you very much can. And it, so, yes, I agree 100%. It has some interesting, very interesting and crucial leadership lessons in there. My answer to what I think a good fire chief would be. Oh, boy. <laughs> you were you were, think, you were stewing on this. I, I did, but I'm, bring, I'm gonna what I will do is hit cliff notes. Do it. What's best for the civilians. Yes. And the inner, in your area. What's best for your firemen what's best for your department and then what's best for everyone else that's involved. Like there's other departments like we talked about the other day. There's other departments that are involved. Street department, uh, sanitation, parks, a multitude of others, a handful of others. And depending on even if, but if you're in a fire district, it's, it's different. But if you're in a city, but see everything you have you're to think about the big piece of pie. You're talking about Paul exactly, pie exactly. That you have out of the larger piece of pie. That was a point we were talking about the other day because what you're talking about is politics, right? Mm -hmm. And I said a good fire chief is also somebody who recognizes that his agency is only one department amongst several departments that make up a city government, right? Which I'll go ahead and tell you right now. I will say this, and I'll be I'm very open about this. I it is so difficult as a basic, you know, private, a, a, a fireman, it's so difficult to remember that. It's yes. so difficult to, right. Right. to remember like, oh, this dude's got to go talk to, you know, a, a, a council and yeah. convince them of why we need a new X and engine, X and right? X and X. <laughs> Which us is in our position, we need that stuff. Right. We, we need to be on top of our game for the, for the civilians, the, the people that we serve, we're public servants, the people that we serve, they deserve the best, absolute best care they could possibly give or get. And on top of that, we need to be safe. For us being safe on a fire ground, we need a lot more guys for us to be, act safely. Right. We get, I think, I feel like I get caught up. I'll say this about me because I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I get caught up in saying, we need X amount of firemen. We don't get it. I'm like, damn, this dude didn't do it. And I'm like, and then I didn't sit there and think about it until I told, I spoke with the right. chief about it. And I was like, wow, like I, 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 I don't understand fully everything that that position holds and entails. I'm not a fly on that wall when he's in the office talking right. to the, the mayor. When he's That's talking, exactly what I'm getting when any, at. When any chief, I, yeah. unless you're a fly on the wall on that yeah. and there's some corruption going on or anything which I have no idea it's it's difficult to think about that role unless you've been in it absolutely and it and it just seems like a headache to me <laughs> that's what it well is. I'm sure if you asked somebody who is a fire chief they, they would agree with you um, but it I'm, I'm reminded of what again what we said the other day in our discussion that you know 
it's often hard when you're on the line to consider if, if you're if you're the firefighter on the ground and you have the ground level view your officer probably has to have the thousand foot view right because you're just you're the guy on the, that that runs the line puts the fire out or is the the care provider on an EMS call you're only concerned about that but your officer has to have a higher view right he has to have the thousand foot view he's got to be thinking about a few more things than you do the scene as a as a uh, as a totality of the circumstances and then the battalion chief that he answers to has to have an even wider view and then the district chief or the deputy chief or whoever is above them in your organization has to have an even broader view. You know, maybe they're at the 100,000-foot view. The battalion chief might have been at the 10,000-foot view. They're at the 100,000-foot view. And, you know, then the, fi- the, the fire chief has to have an even broader view than that. And so I think that that analogy of using perspective is a good way to conceptualize it because it makes you realize when you are the person on the ground that I, I think everyone can agree when you're standing on top of a mountain, you can see a lot farther than you can when you're just standing on the ground, generally speaking. So you're on the ground. You're at that ground level view. So somebody who's much higher up on, on the mountain or at a higher elevation, they're going to be able to see a lot farther than you are. And that's that broader view. And, that, and it, that's how I conceptualize some of these leadership decisions. And sometimes, you know, I catch myself doing it, but it, it helps me remember that when my boss makes decisions, he has to have that greater view than I do. And, and I also really like the analogy used with the pie, the pieces of the pie, right? And the fire chief, he, he had his view. He has to remember that, okay, city, city government is the whole pie, and the fire department is just one slice of that pie. And so all the other pieces of the pie are competing for one pot of resources. And so he's just trying to play politics to get his portion of it. But sometimes as a leader, the right thing for him to do is to remember, I'm only one slice of the pie. You know what? We could really use a new, we really want a new fire engine right now or a new tower ladder. But the police department is really hurting for squad cars this year. I mean, really hurting. Okay. All right. I'm going to tell the guys we have to hold off. We'll put our, our want on hold because we don't need it. We just want it. We can make do. We can get by. So the police chief can have that money to get the police cars that he needs. That's, Think of that, that, how different is that 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 view? That how broader is that view than the person on the ground? But how be. often do we cast that judgment of what, yeah. what the heck's that fire chief doing? What's that guy doing, man? So that's I, just I, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I've cast that judgment. I have too. I have too. The them working together. It's, let's say that fire chief does do that for the police chief. That would be an enormous. That would be an enormous stride in communication. Effective communication, absolutely, with different entities. Yeah. If you look at any NIOSH report, near the near near miss reports, near death reports, or death reports of firemen, fire firefighters, firemen, wh- the three things usually that you'd see at the top. I was I'll name one of them because you always see it's either number one or number two from what I've read is communication. Yeah. Communication has always failed on every one of those disastrous scenes. If you sit and listen to other departments that are on a fire scene, you can sit and listen on the radio and, li- and listen to their op. Or their you can tell that sometimes when there's a lot of talking, uh, from what I've noticed, and also have had discussion with or listened in discussion with my officer, Chris Harrell, and my uh, other fireman, Jake Harshi. Jake, Jake. That's weird to say Jake Har- Jacob Harshi. Um, I've even heard them say too much talking, not enough communication. Sure. And when they said that, I noise. kind of laughed. Noise. It's just noise. And I laughed and I was sitting there thinking, I'm like, <laughs> too much talking, no communication. I'm like, yeah, that's funny. Because it's, it's like an oxymoron, kind of. That'd be the right term for it, I believe. Right, it is, and but when they explained it and I thought about it more, I'm like, that is one hundred percent correct. A lot of talking going on, not a lot of communication of what's going on. Yep. And then, then you get your whole radio discipline and all that. That's a whole other discussion topic. But that that definitely opened my eyes up more with communication. And what, what am I talking about? How am I communicating, and what do I need to convey to you to get the message across? What 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 message do I need to convey to the listeners? 
that I need to convey to cross over to them that they can understand. Half the time when I'm talking, I'm mumbling anyways, and it don't make sense. <laughs> but hopefully, <laughs> sometimes it makes sense. So you mentioned leadership, especially leadership in a fire chief position or in, in any position because anybody can be a leader. Yeah, this applies across the, the whole board, everybody. Yeah. What were some – what are some good – What's a good base foundation for somebody to start collecting attributes to become a good leader? Wow, that's a loaded question, right? I know. Um, but I, I think I know where you're going with this, and it has to do with the pile of books on the table, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's um, six of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and, and as you know, as, as people who know me well know, I travel with a suitcase of books half the time. But, um, you know, it's tough. And they, and we've had our conversations about nature versus nurture, right? Like mm-hmm. what defines a, a good leader. <coughs> but the answer for me personally has been in reading and studying. I don't. I don't even say that I read anymore. I study because if you if you flip through any of my books, you'll see they're all notated, they're highlighted, there's notes, there's pages earmarked. There's, there's, you know, I, I, I'll rip a book apart in, while I'm consuming it. I consume a book. That's a good way to put it. I don't just read it. I consume and I study. And so I, I think you might even be trying to get at what we talked about with former Secretary of Defense James Mattis, uh, Mad Dog Mattis as some people, mm-hmm. which, by the way, he hates that, that moniker for, for uh, those who are wondering, but um, at least that's what he says in his book. But... Um, there's a quote in there by him, and and if I have to, I'll get the book. Well, I'll just get it out because yeah, I don't. That, I don't want to screw it up, because I'm invariably I will. Because when we talked, but about we it liked before, it. I do like it. It's it's a very, it's a very straightforward, blunt yeah. statement. That it can is offend easily. It can be pointed. Yeah. Well, and he he says it in a in a pointing manner in the book. Um, but you know, we'll we'll let the the audience decide. Of course, I, I know, I'm sure I know where they'll land on it. But he says, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you are functionally illiterate, and you will be incompetent because your personal experiences alone aren't broad enough to sustain you. Any commander who claims he is too busy to read is going to fill body bags with his troops as he learns the hard way. That's that's pointed. No doubt, but the point he's making there, and and again, he's he's intending. You know, know your audience, right? What, he's in- he, what would you think he thinks about <coughs> Floyd Mayweather? <laughs> <laughs> you want to know why? Because he can't read. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he can't read. So, what do you think he thinks about him? Oh gosh, let's look that up. Uh, are we really looking that up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he says he's literate, but. <laughs> He couldn't. He couldn't read a teleprompter. Yeah, well, he's a heck of a fighter, though. Yeah. I mean, he can still fight. So maybe he's proving Mattis wrong there because he can still fight. <laughs> Man, I he's still a good strategist. A lot of people think he's illiterate. I think he's illiterate. Yeah, he's still a good strategist. So, all right. Sorry about that. Continue. No, you're good. I, I that literally <laughs> popped in my head like, what is he thinking, Floyd Mayweather? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> Well, like I said, maybe he's proving Mattis wrong there because he's at, he's still a heck of a fighter. So uh, maybe we've just proven it wrong. Yeah, but I, uh, real quick, and then we can go back to that topic. Mike Tyson. I, I read a quote or a statement about Mike Tyson. He doesn't think that Floyd Mayweather is that good. He he threw out four or five names of other fighters. That were what, what led to that conclusion? Why why did he? Because it was his. Uh, I believe Mayweather was at. 50 and 0, but he was talking about other fighters that one of the fighters had it was 80 and 1. Okay. If you're 80 and 1, that means you probably well, won 70. Well, yeah, and what I was going to ask was, is it a function of who he's fighting? It was definitely, yeah, definitely a function right. of who he's fighting, but it, I'm, I'm no expert on boxing. Neither am I. But uh, I do listen to Mike Tyson because he can kill me with <laughs> one punch. <laughs> but when when I was reading that quote, I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. He threw out three or f- four or five guys' names that were just – their records were impeccable. The people that they fought at the time they fought was just amazing and just weren't picking and choosing their fights, which, hey, you know, he's still a great boxer. He'd still kick my ass any day. <laughs> but <laughs> listening to Mike Tyson, a guy who would eat my face. I was going to say, is it like the story you told about where you, you was it a right hand you took and it knocked oh, you down? Oh, yeah. You got, got, got flat. I got busted. It was, a le- it was actually a left hook. <laughs> I got busted. I, I like that story. I used to. I'll tell it real quick. 
So we'd get bullied in school. Me and my brother, I got an identical twin brother. And we'd get bullied. And we're so nice. And we're still really <laughs> nice. But we wouldn't want to hurt anybody. So really just let anything slide. And we were, I was in a headlock one day. And then uh, he came home and told my dad about it. And my dad goes, I said, you, you're going to fight somebody. And we put you in boxing and self-defense. So they put us in boxing and self-defense. And then I got a little cocky when I was boxing. We're doing all that training. Were you an animal back then, too? No. Yeah. No, I wasn't. I was, uh, I was athletic. I, oh, I was fat, tur, like fatter. Um, and then I started to lose weight when I became a cadet because I was told to lose weight. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was told to lose weight. And uh, so I started losing weight. And then, But comparatively, were you still a bigger kid? No. Yeah. No, I, um, I wasn't ever bigger. Okay. Um, but – so I started doing a lot of sparring stuff, and there was this guy who was a Gold Coast fighter when he was younger. And then uh, I challenged him to a little sparring match, and I started throwing some. The dude was probably 350 pounds. And, uh, <laughs> he looked like uh, Butterball or Butterbean. So, so he was an animal. Yeah, he was a big dude. He's Yeah, yeah. And uh, I threw a couple, you know, just combos. And he threw one left hook that was pretty mean. And <laughs> my feet stayed like in the same. My whole body was straight. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it just rotated <laughs> where I was parallel with the ground. And I just remember like it, uh, it happened so fast that I was like, <gasps> God, what just happened? I'm done. Man. And how did he respond? What, what happened after that? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, I did not get back up and fight. Continue fighting him. <laughs> I was like, "All right, that was one hit, dude. I'm done with you." And I went and fought some chick. And kicked her ass. <laughs> so you're you're uh, Floyd Mayweather now, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, she she you're said got, I, you're she blowing I, Mayweather she, smoke, man. And you're like, oh, uh, I went and fought some chick. No, she was a uh, she was a fighter. I was gonna say she probably beat you up me. too. <laughs> she was quick, but I had the weight behind me, obviously. Uh, but it wasn't like I'm trying to beat you up. It was I need to learn. Right. And she was right. quick. She was so quick. She she jabbed. Anyways, we so don't well, need to talk well no, it's that. relevant, right? Because you you um, because we're we're kind of leading into talking about humility, you know, and that's a huge piece of of leadership. And and, and you know, when we're talking about like a pointed quote, like I just threw out there that somebody like Mattis says, you know, like that's obviously a very directed pointed quote. You know, if, if I were to, you made the comment the other day, like if I walked up to a, a fire chief or a division chief and I said that to them, uh, they, you know, they wouldn't like it. <laughs> it would make them mad, right? There's certain things that... Wait, but it's an it, ego thing. And, it's, it's, it's and a, I say it's that it's, it's inherent to all of us, right? I'm not saying that as if I'm above it, but it, it would definitely, it, it's just a jab at the ego if you're not somebody who's... Um, or if you if you hear that quote and you're like, oh, I haven't read hundreds of books, so I guess I suck, you know, right? That that's kind of a jab at the ego. So, but it kind of goes to what you were saying that you know it pays to have an air of humility to read something like that and realize you know, and and apply it to yourself, right? I think we we were talking about another book um, on the psychology of military incompetence, which I recently picked up. Good friend of mine and classmate at NPS, Steve Espinoza. He's a captain in the ESU for NYPD. Um, he, he got his hands on it uh, before I did and made sure that I did as well. Um, but it's it's a book that I think that every, not just fire service leader, but every anyone who aspires to be a leader of any kind of organization, period, should read. And the author is, admittedly, he's very pointed in things he says, and almost like the point of being humorous. But it's it's easy, and, and I, I don't know if I've heard this. It was Jocko Willink, and I'm not a big Jocko podcast guy. I, I, I only listen to the ones that I find applicable or the ones I really enjoy. But he did a series of podcasts on this book, and I, I did listen to that one, and I really enjoyed it. I think it was him who made the point that when you read a book like this, because it's, it's full of stories analyzing where military leaders have failed. It's basically why most military leaders suck is basically what you could change the title to. Oh my gosh. I was listen. I listened to two episodes of that with the chocolate. Did Mark. you? Yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, you might've heard him say in there. Mm-hmm. It's when you're, when you're reading through a book like this, it's really easy from a point of ego to be, to be like one of two things. 
to read it and read some of the the anecdotes, the stories, and think, "Well, that guy was really stupid. I would never do that. They were an idiot." Or two, um, I know some people like that that I work mm-hmm. for that are stupid like that and would make a stupid decision like that. It's easy to start casting stones, but the the frame of reference or the lens you should really be um, reading this book through is one of self assessment. You should really be reading this and and saying and being honest with yourself and saying you know what, I could see myself making a mistake like that or I've made a mistake like that before or, you know, okay, all right, I'm going to use the lessons in this book and find a way to make myself better and, and be introspective about it and not use it as ammunition to cast stones outwardly, if that makes sense. And that kind of, again, it goes back to the humility piece we were talking about because there was a quote in there. It was a, what was the quote that I read? And I was like, man, if you said that around a firehouse kitchen table, you would you would get thrown out. Here, here it is. Mothers of Incompetence is the name of the chapter, chapter 23. The adult who is under the dominion of unilateral respect for the elders and for tradition is really behaving like a child. Say that at a firehouse kitchen table, right? You're probably going to get the mashed potatoes in your face, right? So, uh, um, again... uh, But with saying that, how how do we change that's that stigma how do we change or just that well i mean you're asking to change human nature there right Um, but then again if you have enough you can you can form a piece of coal into a diamond sure that's that's a good way to put it so over time if you have good leaders that are trying to do what's best for those around them and you have a department that's, oh, she's awesome. And you have a department that is constantly trying to form diamonds. Well, either weed You'll those shine. ones out, right? Or they'll come through and shine. Yeah. So, how yeah. does that happen? What rules? Now, we don't have to answer this question. No, I see. It could be. It, this goes back. I, I love how our conversations flow every time we, we get we dig into this stuff because you and I are always, it, it, they always come to the same places and they're good places. We, we kind of had, and again, even though I think we're taking a different path, we're, we're, we're going about it a different way than we did in the original episode. We're still arriving at the same places organically, which I love. I think this is where this, this applies or invokes what we were talking to about Dr. Jordan Peterson mm-hmm. and. If you what he says about change, if you want to change the world, start with yourself, right? So how do we how do we overcome those things that that um, I don't want to say mantra, but maybe may, you know uh, that culture of of being egotistical in the fire service or or, or any um, related profession like the military, like this. The, he, Dr. Norman Dixon takes aim in, of the military in his book. How do you overcome that? Well, if you go around with a book like this and you start beating folks over the head, pretty quickly you become what Malcolm Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell calls the holy fool. Right? The holy fool, and it comes, uh, Talking to Strangers is his book where he, he talks about the holy fool. And the holy fool is somebody who says things that, that, that are true. He, che- he speaks truth to power. He says things that are true that nobody wants to hear, but probably needs to hear. And if you just go around beating people over the head with the truth, even if you're right, it's eventually to your own detriment. And uh, Jocko even talks about that. He talks about um, um, what he calls um, prophets, people who are prophets. It's never good to be a prophet, right, because you're scorned in your age and you're, you're revered after you're dead and gone. Right? That's what you become. And a lot of the reason for that, too, is it goes back to the biblical reference we talked about, right? You, you, why are you worried about the, what's the reference? You have the, the stick in my eye when you have. Oh, no. Uh, why am I worried about the stick in your eye when I have a plank in my own? There you so go. That. Yeah. Right. That, and that's what it goes back to. That's, that's, that is the ultimate way people fire back when you start beating them over the head with the truth. Well, you're not so great yourself either, bro. So chill out. So I think the, the answer to that problem is. I think it's spec. Is it is it? speck in your eye when I have a plank in my eye? I believe that's what it is. Is that what it is? Yeah, because I have a speck in my eye. Yeah. Do you? I thought it was a twinkle. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> not a twinkle. 
No, I think I think it goes back to what we, what we were talking about with Doctor Peterson with, with you know, getting yourself in order, and then once you're in order, which is a challenge, right? It's a, it's a challenge to keep yourself in order, but being a good example and then controlling your little piece of the world or making your little piece of the world better, and eventually that'll have a rippling effect outwards. Uh, now, again, that sounds very aspirational, and it sounds very hopeful, I guess you could say, and, and it does. It's even sounds a little counterintuitive, right? Because we want, or, or as humans, we like strong leaders who come in and take control, take charge uh, a lot of times. But um, I think one of the best ways you can lead oftentimes is just keeping your own affairs in order and, and creating a good example. There was an awesome speech done. We talked about this in the last, in the ghost episode uh, at the University the of Texas and at Austin in 2014. It was the commencement address by Admiral William H. McRaven. It's if you guys if anybody hasn't seen that. Sorry, I had to look it up to read it. If anybody hasn't seen that yet, that's a terrific speech that the admiral gave. And he he says, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed. And when I first heard that, I'm like, that's stupid, because this is a while ago. I'm like, that's stupid. I, cha- I made my bed this morning, and the world ain't changed yet. So, no. But once he's gone into and explained it, it's just one step at a time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and, and uh, Will McRaven, uh, actually, he's a graduate of my school, Naval Postgraduate School. Mm-hmm. He was another person that inspired me. I think I, in the ghost episode, I talk about Chief Joe Pfeiffer and, and what my ultimate aim was or what I, where I'm heading, but we're trying to head. But Will McRaven w- is a graduate of Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, I think he was one of the first students, if not the first, in MPS's Special Operations Master's Degree Program or something to that effect. And uh, his thesis actually became a book that kind of set him along a path that he he eventually became the commander of Joint Special Operations Command, which uh, is the command that includes or is over, however you want to look at it, teams like that, that that people have heard of, like SEAL Team 6 or Dev Group is, is what it's technically called, and then um, CAG, Combat Applications Group, or Delta Force, as most people have, have heard it called. Uh, he w- he was in charge of those entities, and, and he oversaw the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. Um, and, I, and I believe he was in some sort of leadership role as well. It might have been over JSOC whenever... Um, we put those seals on the ship and shot the Somali pirate, and, and it's sca- the details. The name of the ship's ex- escaping me, but um, for just a, someone who became a very influential person in both politics and military affairs and, and foreign affairs in the United States, um, and that's exactly what he's getting at: is start with yourself, start with that small task, and then work outward with what you know. Don't don't allow your reach to be greater than your grasp because you're going to fail. So start small. Start with what you can control and work your way out slowly. Let's go ahead and talk about what your goal is for your career. Sure. Oh we gosh. did talk about this in the ghost episode. We did. So we started we, out with it, actually, but like I said, it just seems like things organically flow. Yeah. yeah. What is it that you want to reach a position-wise? Sure. Um, well, I, I don't think I can... I can just flat out saying that without explaining where where I came from, right? Because you got to know where you've been to know where you're going. Uh, and and we kind of talked about this kicking off about what my aims were with moving on from IFD and accepting a full time position, which is a phenomenal job, right? This is a job people don't leave. But but what what was my what were my or are my intentions and in where I'm heading? Um, and I think I'm in the ghost episode. I had talked a little bit about how I was highly influenced by 9-11 as, uh, I guess I was a kid, you can call me a kid at that time. Um, My mother, probably against her better judgment, allowed me to watch the movie by the French brothers, I think it's the Naudet brothers is how you say their name, that they they followed Battalion Chief Joseph Pfeiffer uh, on 9-11 that day. The documentary. The documentary, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a very famous documentary. It's a phenomenal documentary. But uh, the, the the man that, that one of the brothers ends up following is Chief Joseph Pfeiffer. He's the first arriving battalion chief at the World Trade Center that day and then went on to help lead the rescue effort to get everybody out. And Chief Pfeiffer went from there to apply everything he had learned to bigger, higher-level national security problems. So he went on from there to become more or less the FDNY's first counterterrorism chief, and then he 
went to the Naval Postgraduate School, went, went to my program, and got his master's degree. And then he became a senior fellow at the at West Point's Counterterrorism Center, which is an awesome publication, an awesome research center. He's a senior fellow there. And then I'm pretty sure he's also a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I think he got his second master's there at, at, at Harvard Kennedy School in Public Affairs. And then he went on from there to um, work on congressional efforts uh, to have fire recognized as a terrorist weapon, which is big considering the Benghazi event, right? So he he progressed in, in his career and, and took everything he learned at, on uh, from 20 to 30 years in the FDNY and then ultimately 9-11 and applied it to progressively bigger problems, national security problems. And as I was, you know, I, I automatically knew I wanted to start a, a career in the fire service because of 9-11, but he was somebody in particular that I watched. And it, I, I guess over time I realized that there's, there is a role for firefighters to play or for people with local emergency response experience to play in larger national security affairs. And so that's what I set out to do, much like Chief Pfeiffer. I just, you know, I, I think I just took a little more of a direct path, but it was all inspired by him. And so kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode where, you know, the decision to leave IFD is because I was fulfilling a dream is because I saw, I saw that dream actualizing for myself. I saw my opportunity and, and said, well, you know what the heck put time to put my money where my mouth is. I've been talking about this for years about how I eventually want to take everything I've learned in the fire service and apply it to these bigger level problems. Well, this is my opportunity. It's time to put my money where my mouth is. It's time to do it. You know, and, and as uh, there's a, a pararescue man out there who runs a page and it'll come to me might be ones ready or something like that uh, or how to be a PJ or something like that for anyone who's into the SOF stuff but he uses the term burning your boats and basically burning your boats means not giving yourself an excuse to fail or get not you know not is giving yourself under fire no we'll get to that yeah, we'll no no no, no. We'll, we, we'll make sure we get to that but no he talks about burning your boats which not giving yourself an option to return you have to succeed because there's no other option and so that's the, 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 the impasse that I felt that I was in my life, and that's, that's why I decided to do what I'm doing. And so where I'm ultimately trying to head, um, you know, this is a big thing to say. It's a big thing to proclaim. But uh, my, my original goal was to try to hold eventually, and, and this is years upon years down the road, but eventually hold a role such as Assistant Secretary of, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for, uh, for Homeland Defense Integration and Defense Support uh, of civil authorities, which is a huge title, right? But it's it's basically the, the a couple tiers under the Secretary of Defense who's specifically over what I talked about earlier in the episode, the, the Seaburn Response Enterprise and supporting civil authorities. And, and that, by the way, that has such a huge, it's such a broader um, range of applicability outside of just nuclear detonation that I talked about earlier. Like even even the, the violence that happened o- over the summer of 2020, I think, and the, the National Guard Bureau support to D.C. police during that, and then National Guard Bureau support to D.C. police during the, the uh, events at the Capitol on January 6th. That all falls under that umbrella. So it's all it's basically the DOD's role in homeland security, and we call it sometimes we call it homeland defense, um, and include some other national affairs level things. And then I got to thinking about it, and I was like, you know what? Might as well shoot for the stars, right? Because you never know where you might end up. So I said, and, and someone much smarter than me suggested this to me. They said. You know, I think you could be the Secretary of Defense one day or, or something like that, and that's what you should be aiming for. And then if you land in one of those lower-level positions, then you succeeded. You didn't fail. And so that, that's a huge thing to say, right, on, on, in a public forum because you're going to have people watching, right? And there's probably going to be people who want to see me fail in that endeavor or, or are going to hold me accountable. We talked about accountability, right? Going to hold me accountability when I'm not doing the right things to get there, and that's a good thing. Um, but... That's that's kind of my aim now. Is is it, the ultimate goal was always to find an outlet for the experience I have on the local emergency response level, and apply it to bigger national security things. Um, you mentioned leadership under fire. Do you want me to jump into that or? or? Yeah, I was, but I was going to say first the uh, long answer short, Secretary of Defense. <laughs> man, that's such a big thing to say. It's a huge thing to say, but you know what? Why not, man? Shoot for the stars. People in American Idol won somehow. So. <laughs> You, can, you might get it. Who knows? Who knows? But um, I have a, a visceral gut feeling that, that I'm on the right path. And so I'm, I'm listening to that for better or for worse. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Hey, that you know, cool. and I think that's biblical too. But, oh, but, it uh, definitely is. But, yeah. Uh, leadership under fire. Yeah. 
Let's, so, that. Let's talk about that. Yeah, because that's another good resource for for folks who wondered kind of where I picked up some of these books. And um, well, we had, we had talked about uh, the role of, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, but in the uh, the ghost episode, we talked a little bit about the role of education in the fire service, and and I guess what kind of turned me on to the idea of reading books and studying in parallel to gaining experience, right? Because we had a huge discussion about the role of education and training versus experience. And and really that Mattis's quote kind of speaks to some of that. Obviously you have to have both, right? Because you, you've had you've had some big names on this podcast like uh, Chief Stahl, Chief Grass. I mean, you talk about guys that just were incredible experience. And it shows. It shows in their performance on the fire ground. It shows in their performance at work. Um, so it's definitely not one sided. And I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm standing amongst giants and just being here in that regard. But um, what what originally turned me on this idea of the importance of reading and studying was I, I attended one of the first conferences of uh, for leadership under fire. Um, and I, did we already mention Jason Bresler? Did we already kind of talk about him a little bit? We did on the ghost episode, but not on this okay. Um, Jason Bresler, he's a FDNY firefighter who was also a major in the Marine Corps. I was talking about him earlier. That's what, that's what I'm, I'm thinking of. He was also a major in the Marine Corps. And he actually lost his commission. He got in trouble for, for sharing some information over an unsecured line to try to save some troops overseas. And he was doing the right thing. And so the, the original, initially he got in trouble, and he sued to get his commission back and won. Um, so... He runs this initiative called Leadership Under Fire. Originally, it was geared towards the fire service. And it was the first conference I ever attended where there was a reading list before you got there. I was like, huh, that's strange. right? And so I start looking, flipping through the titles. Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez. Um, Boyd by Robert Corum. Uh, Moneyball. Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Like these, these were titles that had, on the surface no translation or relation to the fire service. So I was like, what What the heck? But they were all about decision-making. And so at the same time, they had everything to do with the fire service, right? And after I get there and we're talking about human performance and, and r- managing risk and decision-making, I, I just, you know, you realize, like, holy, holy cow, these, these books have everything to do with the fire service because they talk about all these things and they speak to them and there's lessons here that can be applied. And so that's what really kicked off my, I guess, my love affair with higher education and studying and reading and, and how it's important for anybody who wants to work in a line of work like the fire service. We spoke about a little bit, you mentioned nature versus nurture. And in the episode with <coughs> uh, Chief Sean Grass, I, I wish I would have read the quote on it or wrote the sure. quote down. That way I don't butcher it at all. Sure. But you can only learn so much in a book. Absolutely. There's also the the aspect of the experiences that you'll go through. Yeah. And earlier uh, when you mentioned the senior fellow, I looked it up real quick and just in case anybody was wondering what a senior fellow was, is a senior fellow is the most experienced or most successful of an elite group of people who work together as peers in an academic setting. So... That's that was what that term means, but with that being said, for Chief Schaefer, correct, Chief Schaefer, the experience. That oh, he, Chief Pfeiffer. 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 Yeah. Sorry. For the experience that he got from nine eleven, yeah, it's unparalleled. It's, yes. Right. I was saying the big word bigger too. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> My bad. <laughs> Insurmountable is what I said. That's all right. It just kind of spilled out there. there. Your word's good too, I guess. But <laughs> the amount of of experience that came from that from anybody from yeah. b- black yeah. helmet all the way up, yeah. But for him to be in that role there, and Chief Sean Grass um, said it very well. It, you, you can just learn so much from a book, but you still have to go out and apply it. Absolutely. Because I use the example of the episode of Dirty Jobs. Yeah. With Micro, uh, yeah. we talked about. Yeah, this. we talked about it a little bit. In the episode, Micro is going to like a sheep farm, and he calls the uh, animal rights PETA. He calls them and says, "Hey, we're going to be removing the testicles out of sheep. How do you guys do this? What protocol do I need to get kind of used to doing?" They say, "Oh, we take rubber bands, wrap rubber bands around the testicles, 
and then wait a couple days, the testicles turn black and blue, then they fall off. And he's like, all right, I know what to expect. So he goes there, and this guy's name, I don't remember the guy's name, it's like Harvey or something. But he goes in there, and he's like, hey, I'm here to help you take testicles off the sheep. And the guy goes, all right. He takes a sheep, flips him on his back, takes the knife, makes a little slit right above the testes, and then takes his mouth down, <laughs> puts the testes in his God. mouth, and yanks them out with his mouth. And <laughs> Mike Rowe is extremely surprised that that's happening right in front of him. Right. Uh, yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah, so then he takes the, you know, take, I think he takes the needle and, and ties the nuts up or the sack up, then lets go of the sheep. And then Mike Rowe steps in and says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? I contacted PETA, and this is definitely not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be taking a rubber band, wrapping around the nuts or the testicles. <laughs> and that guy goes, oh, you know what? You're right. And he asks his wife, he's like, give me a rubber band, puts a rubber band around the next la- uh, sheep's nuts. Uh, testicles, <laughs> trying to sound <laughs> the vernacular of it. Without, puts it around the testicles. Immediately, the sheep goes down to the ground and just lays there, obviously in pain. And he's like, how long will he be like that? He said, for a few days until they fall off. So with that being said, he looks over to the other sheep that just had his nuts cut out. <clears throat> he's jumping around, running around like nothing ever happened. Meanwhile, this other this other sheep that just had the rubber band around his nuts is laying on the ground. He can't move. He's in so much pain. That's an organization that says we're going to do things the nice way and not the mean, aggressive way of cutting them out right away. (laughs) Just because in the books it looks right and it looks nice doesn't mean in real life it's effective. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. a long way of getting around to saying that, but that example to me always sticks out and it's perfect to me. Well, it's perfect for firefighters, right? I will say that is probably the most illustrative anecdote to explain a point I, will I have say ever this. heard. In my I will say life. this. What's the quickest way of me getting out of this house right now, going straight <laughs> through that wall right there? Sure. Maybe the window, <laughs> that's right next to, but straight through that A to B. That's the quickest right. way. That's all, I, that's all I can think about it. No, you, 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 well, you made an interesting point about right, you, because there are naysayers, and, and, and you and I have had this discussions at length about the role of education in the fire service and then of course nature versus nurture and all that it's not education and training are not the solution to everything right and of course if you read a if you read a quote like Mattis's you can you can easily get a false or an illusion that well if I just read a bunch of books I can be an expert and that's not the case at all Education ha- and training have to be supplement have to be supplemented with real world experience, and 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 it was really great that you pulled up that definition of what a senior fellow really is, because the f- reason Chief Pfeiffer was chosen as a senior fellow, as an academic, is because he has experience, right? His experience is what qualified him, in addition to some other things, to sit in that prestigious role and to contribute research. So it's not he's not somebody who just wrote a bunch of books or just read this stuff out of a book. He was there. He experienced it. But he enriches it. He enriches his experience. He capitalizes more off his experience by then applying it, by hitting the books and, 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 and applying it to research and, and writing about it. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we can substitute experience. But reading, just like General Mattis says, it broadens our worldview and enriches our experience. You, you in the ghost episode, you talked about meditation. Mm-hmm. And it was perfect. Because I said, education is the meditation on your experience. It's the reflection, right? When, when you are pursuing an advanced degree or any degree, you learn these skills of analysis, right, where you learn to break things down into their parts and understand them. And then you learn synthesis where you put them back together into new things. That's meditation. That's analyzing your experience and then drawing the lessons from new novel situations. And that's, that's the value, in my opinion, of education for people who have a lot of experience or for the fire service, right? So, I, again, to me, it's, that's, it's, you can supplement or supplant education with meditation in that regard because 
it's enriching your experience and it's making sure we get everything out of it that we can because right, you know folks you know folks who have 20 30 years on the job like how's the saying go they have 20 or 30 years on the job but every year was there just a repeat of their first year you know what i'm talking about mm-hmm. you know those guys right yeah they've been around for 20 years but it's almost like they're i like to say a potato they're a vegetable. There's, there, you know, there's no, there's no analysis going on of their experiences up here. There's no innovation or no synthesis of it's, new things. It's almost kind of like, because <clears throat> obviously I'll state the obvious. It's a, it's a waste of knowledge and experience. Yeah. It's a waste. Yes. It's almost like, I mean, obviously you got the guys that are burnt out. I don't have that much time on, so I can't speak for them to speak on or say why they are burnt out or the way they are. I can't say that until I get to that point where I can understand it. But it also seems like to me that there was never enough confidence in themselves that they would ever achieve a position sure. of leadership or educating others ever in their career. Sure. Sure. So how do you fix that? And when you talked about education is medita- meditation, I agree with that. And you, you can learn anything and then you can read a newspaper and learn something and then that's called education. Sure. For meditating, anything, if you're sitting there and you're thinking about something and you're <laughs> playing it out in your head, it's meditating. You're meditating on something. I, I mow on the days when I'm off work and during the spring, summer, and fall. Meditating most of the time. I'm not listening to music. 90, 98% of the time, I'm not, 99% of the time, I'll say, I'm not listening to music. I'm either listening to a book right. or I'm listening to some something that's going around, on around the world. I'm trying to bring in information. We talked then, about that. Yeah, we did talk about that. I'm uh, listen to 12 Rules for Life. And then yeah. I listened to Beyond Order, and that was all while I'm mowing. And I bring in my nice Bose headphones so I could hear everything, because obviously it's kind of loud. But I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, and I'm like, "Wow, like how how can I apply this to my life?" That's meditating. Yeah, and you can do it for hours and hours and hours, especially if you have a lot of if you have a lot of alone time. Well, I, I would I think it's extremely important to to meditate. And it sounds like some hippie BS, but, it's, <laughs> but even Jesus talks about it. He would he would go off by himself and he would go meditate, and he would sit there and require hours to himself. Just to think and talk to a father. Ah, the the curse of the introvert, right? I know that well. Yeah. Um, well, I, first of all, I would I might even challenge that your perception of education in that regard, and and I and all, and I say that in a you know not a pointed manner, but because that was very much my perception of education at one time, but that was all challenged and changed for me when I went to MPS, and. Someone in particular who had a huge impact on me there was Dr. Chris Belvita. He's just, he, he, they call him the Yoda of Homeland Security. I mean, this guy's the OG. Is he short? Yeah, kind of. Really? Yeah. He's he got big, long ears. I, I would never talk about Dr. Belvita like that. <laughs> <laughs> Although he, <laughs> listening to this, would be like, but he's such, a, he's such an intellectual man. He would be like breaking down everything. It would just be hilarious. You, he's he, just he would break down everything I'm thing. saying and realize like, wow, this guy is stupid. <laughs> I know Brick's smarter than this dude. <laughs> well, <laughs> we were talking about uh, another good friend and classmate of mine, Chris Bagby, right? And how, mm-hmm. um, you know, Chris is from Bakersfield, California and, and yes. he talks like he's from Bakersfield, California. And if you aren't paying attention, that can throw you off. And he, if he listens to this, it's going to be hilarious. But, He's arguably he was arguably one of the smartest people there, so don't never discount that. Um, but Doctor Bellavita, he something he said the way he defined education was, um, it's thinking about thinking while you're thinking. Like he said very clearly when we arrived, and when I say we, the, the cohort arrived in Monterey for the first time, this is not a certification program. We're not going to give you information because you'd said, well, you know, you can you, technically just reading an article in a newspaper and, you know, picking up a new piece of information, that can be education. I don't agree. To me, education, because there has to be something transformative to happen that, for education and learning to have taken place. Well, depending on what the news article is. I'm not saying... Well, sure, like, sure, yeah. sure. Well, yeah, you, you can be... You, yes, absolutely. And, and a news article can, educa- it can educate you. I just don't want to conflate 
the, uh, the, the raw absorption of knowledge with education. That's where I guess I'm making the parallel with meditation is because what you're saying is it's reflection and analyzing. And then after you're analyzing it, you're thinking to yourself, how can that apply to me? That's synthesis. And so those are the elements of education. And so that's, that's where I came from in making that. Maybe I'm just so against the word education because I hate college. That's a real thing. No, that's a real thing. That's a real thing. Yeah. In our fire service, right? We you always hear guys say, and it drives me nuts. And, and they're people that I care about and I agree with generally is they'll say, well, you know, this is a blue collar job. I don't need no, I, we don't need no stinking education. Like, we don't need no stinking badges. We don't need no stink, stinking education, right? And, and I just want to pull my hair out because they're generally the folks saying this are very smart people. And I would, I would love to hear what they would put together if they went to a place like NPS. You know, they have a ton to add to the conversation. Um, but a lot of it's time. The amount of time that would I mean, these guys. Oh, got, sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. For families, sure. Families, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm not. I'm not harping on that in any way. That's, but what that's if there's? Animal. I mean, there's other pro. There's other things out there. Well, yeah, but that's kind of what you were saying. Is there's yeah. other ways to educate yourself. There's yeah. other avenues. So I, mm. I don't think. I think that it. Everyone listening or watching would agree. There's a ton of critical thinking in firefighting or in, in emergency response or related occupations. And anywhere there's a ton of critical thinking, there's room for education because that's what education is. It's teaching you how to think. That was what Dr. Bellavita was trying to impress upon us. You're here to learn how to think. And how we think, learning how to think well is a, is a developed skill. It's not necessarily something you're born with. It's something you can learn. And so learning how to think well, especially under pressure, can absolutely translate to firefighting or emergency response. And I think that was the point that Jason Bresler was making at leadership under fire. What do you think about that? But you're right. There's a stigma around there's, the world of education. I'm still stuck on that because whenever someone tells me you need to go do this, I'm I'm the kind of person that's like, no, just because you said I need to do it, I ain't gonna do well, it. Well, that's now. the best part about, in my opinion, about education is and and going to MPS was is that it also provided some tremendous lessons in leadership the i don't rem- really remember a time where the professors really other than giving us a due date told us in class what we needed to do or what we needed to know it was always discussion based it was always what do you think what do you think have you thought about this and that actually goes back to carnegie's book about how he says if you want to be an effective leader don't give orders ask questions and that's what they did at mps when we sat down we're being educated but at no point did anyone give us an order we were always being asked yeah, questions you uh Mention that and Jocko Willing actually spoke on that. Did he? he said he said he would talk when he would talk to his SEALs, that is when he was a commander. He said a lot of the times he would now I'm remembering as much as I can, obviously. It's been a few nights since I've listened to it. Sure. But he said he would ask his guys, his SEALs, he'd say, What do you think we need to do? Right. And then if he agreed with it, then he'd say, All right, that's an effective plan, we're gonna go ahead and place it. Yeah. And you're running part of it. If I was in a position where I was asked, which I have been asked these questions, if I was asked, what do you think we should do? And then I kind of shout out my answer. And they say, all right, we're going to go with it. It would make me feel validated, assured that I'm being educated properly, and more confident. Yeah. That way, when I go to step into that role of a lieutenant or a ride out, I have that confidence of being able to make the uh, appropriate decision. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it's all about. And it, it shows that they're invested in you, right? And it makes you, in return, invested in the program, whether it's an educational program or it's where you work. Yeah. yeah, your job. Yeah, ab- absolutely. It, 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 they're showing that investment. And... I think we'd even, in, in, in the uh, previous attempt, we talked a little bit about Stanley McChrystal, General Stanley McChrystal's book, Team of Teams. And, of course, McChrystal's another controversial f- figure in, in the national security world. I, I think I, I, just a few weeks ago he was getting another rash uh, in, the, in the media. Um, and, and there's an article that was put out about how his, his proposed method of leadership was not so great at all. And interestingly enough, when I was at MPS, I, w- I was engaged in a debate where I had to tear apart his method of leadership, and I 
did so quite effectively as I wanted to paint. But regardless, the whole premise of his model of leadership is we, we talked a little bit before about how we live in such an information rich environment, right? And so and that's something I think we do tremendously well in general in the fire service is with things like predetermined assignments and 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 trusting the guy on the end of the nozzle to know what he needs, even though he's not the lieutenant or the captain, and you know, so on and so forth. Um, but his, his argument is is that in such an information rich environment, we have to push decision making, or uh, yeah, push decision making down to the level of where the information is being received, right? So in the military is a very traditionally hierarchical organization, and fire departments are paramilitary, paramilitary, so they kind of are too. And so there's this tendency to want to have like this mother may I culture, right, where you have to ask for permission every time you do it. Like, but how ineffective would that be if you, and this is why I think we do so well at this, especially in central Indiana in the fire service, how ineffective would that model be if you had to ask the battalion chief or you had to ask the officer to ask the battalion chief if you were allowed to open the nozzle? Extremely ineffective. Right. Time consuming. Honestly, it wouldn't be followed. No, it, it wouldn't. Would, not it not wouldn't in our culture. Followed. But that's also a pretty good. That's another discussion to open up on. I mean, obviously asking, you know, for, for permission rather than well, asking for forgiveness rather than permission. There's the. There's the general scope of. Officers either being chiefs or lieutenants or fire chiefs that are extremely uh, controlling. They bottleneck a lot. Or say the word. I, oh, I, yeah, again, I'm so bad at this changing that. <laughs> it's all right. The uh, what is it? What is it called when somebody's a uh, oh shit, <laughs> dude? I'm having a total brain fart. Right it's now. all good, dude. When somebody's a uh, pointing out, God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, are you I talking about like authoritarian, like you know, who is got their finger on you all the okay. time? Okay, yeah. Somebody micromanaging. Is, micromanaging. I think that's what you were searching that's for. That's what it was. The issues of having micromanagers, letting them still be the micromanager. You see it in the world of business. You see it in the world of firefighting. You see, you see it in everything. But if you still, if you let somebody continue in that role, it's just going to get worse. Yes. Then at that point, the buy-in goes away. Yes. If you have a leader, either at the middle grade of a, of a department or at the higher grade or higher levels, you will have no, you will not have buy-in nor morale. Absolutely. How do you retain that if you have been so lucky to avoid? being micromanaged but there's also a fine line yeah you can't just let everybody be a cowboy yeah but you can't be a micro you should not be a micromanager and there's there's differences of opinions of letting the (coughs) letting the fire having the fire chief be his role an authoritarian role there's those discussions yeah i agree and disagree on some of those the battalion being more of an authoritarian role I, there's disagreements and agreements on that, but if you're if you're a battalion chief and of a scene, you're you're not you should not be micromanaging every little thing because what's going to happen? You're not seeing every you're not seeing everything going on inside. Right. You're not seeing everything going on even on the outside. You can't. There's right. no way you can see every single little thing happening, which is why you have many eyes on that scene to try to capture as much of information coming out of that incident, whatever it be. There's a huge issue with people in <clears throat> in the positions of... <laughs> sorry, dude, she's... No, oh, she's fine. She's, she's just fine. She's there's, just a love bug. Oh, yeah, she is. Um, there's definitely issues in the departments. Every department's got to have this of micromanagement. Do you think with that issue that it should be disciplined or should it just be something that is a, not really, you can't really admonish. Admonish, you'd have to, 
either take disciplinary action of somebody who's doing that because it's getting to a point where it hurts departments. You're talking about just trying to create this culture of create a culture of that. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah it's, I'm struggling putting it into words, but my main, no, I understand my, what you're getting. My you're my, getting. my main part of this is it's going to be a huge issue if you keep continuing it, and we know that it's a huge issue. The micromanaging is, and all that. Yeah, the yeah. micromanaging. The thing is, is how do you fix that? By disciplinary action? By yeah. demotion? Yeah. What's the effective Sometimes. Way? Sometimes, right? Because... What's the uh, effective way? Well, what I think you're talking about <clears throat> as far as a solution is trust, um, right? Because I, I don't think... Y- you've asked about what's... What is the solution to solving the problem of micromanaging? Do we involve discipline? Do we, um, what do we, what do we do about it? How do we make it go away? How do we enforce it? And, and then what I, you know, what I was going to say was, to some degree, yes, because you'd ask, do, do we just get rid of officers who are that way, or or should the fu- should a fire chief fire officers who are that way? Well, what I will say that I have learned is there there is a saying in leadership, and you've probably heard. Jocko or someone like him say it before that, uh, or maybe was it was it Jocko who said this or was it uh, David Goggins? I'm not, I'm not. I think it was Jocko, but he said there are no bad boat crews, just bad boat crew leaders. And Jocko, I think, put the corollary on that that well, yeah, that's true. But there's also a point where you kick somebody off the crew, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, sometimes the answer is. You've got to go, and we can all think probably think of those folks on our jobs that no ma- no amount of goodwill or reform is going to reform. Uh, so, yeah, but there is a time and a place. Yeah, but what well, I th- I think you're thinking of talking about trust is what I really think you're talking about. Uh, yeah, but then also you got to build trust. The healthy way of trying to avoid a situation like that or scenarios like that where you have somebody who is more of an authoritarian who gets the power to their head, I think it needs to be a reminder, like uh, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, when he was in power, had a guy that would stand over his shoulder, and once he was getting a bunch of praise, that guy would tell him, you're still just a man. Yeah. You're still mortal. Yeah. He would say something in whatever language they spoke, but it's like you're, just, you're still mortal, just to re- as a reminder. Right. You're not a god. You're nobody that's better than anybody else. And we can all use that reminder. And we can all time. use that reminder. I could use that reminder. Yeah, me too. Especially when I go to the gym. <laughs> Just a dude. <laughs> you can still get hurt when you're lifting. As you're over there lifting while you're listening to your books. <laughs> yeah, Julius Caesar. <laughs> oh, 12 Rolls of Life. <laughs> Definitely. Dude. I was listening to Maps of Meaning actually at the gym today. I was doing shit. Which I haven't had the opportunity to pick up, but I know is phenomenal. It's a very good book, but man, I mean, I could only take so much at a time. What is it about, if you don't mind me asking, what is it about his writing style? Or what, what is it that, that makes it that way for you? I'm assuming it's a writing style, but what is it about? Because when I, I mean, I'll admit, sometimes like like these books I have in front of me, like on the psychology of military incompetence, it's, it's obviously written by a dude who has a PhD. And so sometimes it is like, it's difficult to take and I have to take it in small doses versus a book like Deep Survival who's written by a journalist, Lawrence Gonzalez, and it's very much more digestible in my opinion. But, so I experience that too. That's why I'm asking, like, what, what, what is it about it? Is it just the way Dr. Peterson talks? I love the way he talks. I do too. I love how he breaks down even his own discussions. Thinking about thinking while you're thinking, as Dr. Yes. Chris Bellavita would say. And he'll sit there, and I'll I'll listen to, I'll listen to him talk all day long. His books, his book, Maps of Meaning, is pretty difficult for me to understand. But but why? What is it about it? What is it about that's so difficult to understand? Yeah, what makes it so difficult the for verbiage? You? Okay, okay, that's the what I thought. The yeah. imagination of trying to put together the discussion that he's having is it's it very lofty, like high level, deep stuff. That that's kind of hard to conceptualize i wouldn't say it's a very high level uh, deep stuff but it is definitely intelligent okay thought yeah that requires so much more to just like when when i when i was reading uh when i was re- reading parts of it i was thinking to myself and i thought the same thing with with uh your paper that you wrote in that <laughs> yeah. journal 
I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not comparing you to Jordan Peterson. Please do. Well, no, well, number yeah. one, please don't. Yeah. Two, my I, I'm very aware that my article <laughs> is the. Uh, it's the antidote for insomnia. So if, yes. you, if you need to go to sleep at night, just, uh, well, hmm, yeah. I'm by Bob Wagner. Yeah, I'm not saying it was an exciting, thrilling <laughs> journal, but it was definitely <laughs> in very informative, but it was also like, I feel like I should have more knowledge on the... That's what you told me. The the fact of what we're talking about. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's great information. It's good information, like what we talked about. It's really good to know that. Maps meaning I felt like that. I really? felt like, okay. man, there's something I need to be learning more of. But then there's things it's like there's chapters where I'm like, okay, I have an understanding of what he's talking about. And he's he's very good at explaining a lot of things, but just sometimes it's just like, whoa, you're throwing a lot at me. Yeah. Twelve Twelve yeah. Rules for Life. Very, very good book. Very good book. I think everybody should read it. I have another copy actually. I'm hopefully it's on my front porch when I get home. Uh, uh, Twelve Rules for Life. Mm, or oh, the paper copy, I should say. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I went ahead. So I, I'm, I'm. I, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because I have the same problem. And that's actually something I struggle because I, I'm like you. I like, like we talked about this the other day. We talked about inf- how we live in an information rich society and environment right now. Like everything's so information rich and and and. and which is kind of paradoxical to how we act sometimes as a society. But I, I spend, like, I'm like you, I spend so much of my day just trying to absorb all as much information as I can. And so that's why, like you probably, I listen to podcasts and stuff while I work out, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think you've even told me, like, some of your more successful friends, I probably do, probably do the same thing. But I'm, I'm just always trying to consume as much as I can because we talked about decision-making in the, in the other episode that didn't get to air, and uh, maybe, maybe that's something we can pull out from that that you wanted but because I thought that was really good because we talked about you know Colin Powell and his rule and I I know I'll butcher it but you know you you, if you wait until you have 100 percent of the information to make a a decision in the moment the 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 opportunity to make that decision will have been gone so you know shoot for 40 to 70 percent right and so it's impossible especially nowadays it's impossible to have all the information because there's just so much of it so I try to listen to podcasts and stuff too while I'm working out the problem that I have is the same one that you do sometimes is I'll be listening to something like that, but it's so rich in information, like you're saying, and so deep and philosophical, and, and it requires a high, it requires active listening, more active listening than I can devote the energy to when I'm trying to work out. And so sometimes I have to like back off on a certain work. And and so not that Twelve Rules of Life is like that, but a lot of times that's why. You know, I'll listen to a book and then I'll make sure I get the print copy and I always pick up things I missed or vice versa. Like I'll read through it and then I'll simultaneously be listening to it or listen to it later to like, be, be, and especially for me, I remember things better when I hear multiple times or I make connections I didn't make before. And so it's just interesting. I had the same problem. Like, expect, like if, if I try, if I guarantee if I tried to listen to that while I was working out, I would run into the same thing. Yeah, because you're trying to focus on less than the Right, yeah. You're, you're trying to focus on two things at once. It makes it tough. It makes yeah. it really tough. But I tell you what, it's still a pretty good book. It's just big. It's a yeah. big book. Yeah. I, don't, I couldn't tell No, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And, and also, I'm not going to lie to everybody. I'll be honest. Uh, I love to do audio books. Yeah. Audio books is where it's at. Yeah, they're that's, awesome. That's perfect for the active active re- listening, yeah. active reading. And uh, I've, I do have the copies right there, and I'll, I'll thumb through them. Another b- really good book, an adventure book, is uh, Wild at Heart, which is actually that one, obviously. I've read I read that one cover to cover twice. Okay, now. Wild at Heart, is that about the kid in the van in Alaska? No. In the bus in Alaska? No, What's that wild? one's uh, uh, no, The not. Wild. Yeah. I think that one's called The Wild. He ended up dying, didn't he? Yeah, I saw a meme of him the other day where it was like it had a picture that famous picture of him by the bus uh-huh. and and all it says in the meme is plan better. Yes. I like that one. <laughs> no, uh Wild at Heart. I haven't read that book in probably 2 years now. Um but it's an event it's I call it an adventure book. It's a book about being a, a jur- the journey to a man's heart. Okay. Not in the way that most people would think, but it's the journey to a man's heart in the aspect of going back to the roots of manliness let your son go out and get dirty let yeah. him go rip his jeans let yeah. him let him go and have the adventure don't knock him out <laughs> well, that explains why you like dr peterson a lot i mean there's a lot yeah. of the same themes there yeah let boys be boys let girls right. be girls and, and it's like that the gillette commercial i'm gonna get a little bit political now that gillette commercial was absolutely pathetic they had yeah, the you know I have to be 
a political. So I'll let yes, you, yes. you you let you know, in my role, and, and that's how it should be. That you know, yeah. I, I you know, and I've made that clear. You know, in, in my path moving forward, especially with somebody of my goals, is that um, I, I would just like General Mattis. You know, General Mattis is a good example of that. Not to steal from your your thunder here, but um, he was the commander of uh, U.S. Central Command under President Obama, and then he was the Secretary of Defense under President Trump, and so. Um, I, th- I think that's the, the model that, that should be followed of public servants. And so I'm going to remain apolitical, but you, <laughs> I'll go ahead and tell you my story. <laughs> <laughs> Gillette did a commercial where these two boys were wrestling and then all these dads are standing there next to them saying, all oh, boys will be boys. And then something else happens. And then they go, boys will be boys. And then a guy cat calls a girl sure. by just by just seeing some simple statement of oh look at you you're really pretty and it's boys will be boys it's like hold on a second the stigma that was brought and taught is hey you chase the girl you want you know not to a creeper level where you're looking in from the bushes <laughs> but to a level of hey you know girls will lead you on a little bit and then you gotta apply the chase I know I was specifically told that growing up by other girls so boys would do that. And all of a sudden now it's, it would be changed and the, the narrative being pushed by media is completely different. And I do have a, sto- a story to add to that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and I am kind of pushing back in a sense here uh, with just because it's something that affected me. So, again, I go back to NPS. I go back to that a lot because it had such a huge impact on who I am uh, as a person. I had never... And, and again, what you're talking about is the whole political issue of toxic masculinity, right? That's how it's labeled, right? Um, and, and I, too, had struggled with, because with, I understand what you're saying. Someone who had a huge impact on me and my worldview at NPS was a, a very, very intelligent lady named Janice Russell. And um, she was, uh, you know, very much, you know, I, I don't want to categorize her because she's brilliant, you know. She's just a very... Um, just a civil person, right? Like she was somebody that I could always oppose, like bounce an opposing viewpoint off of, and she would bounce things right back. And there was never anything militant about it. it was just it was, that was some of the best learning that I, that ever took place. And, he, and her and I would even talk about it on the side about how I bet people think you know we hate each other right now because we're going back and forth, but really we're just learning, we're just talking about it. So I love that. And something that I I learned from her is so when I had to go, I told you there was a stack of books, or maybe I didn't, but there there's a obviously you go to of school like NPS, there's a reading list you got to show uh, show up with that you've read, you know, hopefully most of. And there was a book entitled "Women in Power," and um, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I challenged a lot of the ideas in the book. But I sat in the room with Russ, uh, Miss Russell, when we were discussing the book, and something she she kind of brought my attention to that I had never considered was she was talking about the way it feels for a woman to kind of be under that pressure sometimes when it's unwanted. And I related it to, and this is going to sound funny, but I related it to being on squad seven downtown for IFD. And sometimes you, I would go into the female ward of the jail and now it was like the roles were reversed. And some of those ladies were aggressive. And I was like, Oh, here's just little old me. Like some of these ladies in here ripped me apart, man. Like, and they were aggressive in the same kind of way. And so I'm not saying either way. I'm just saying that was just a, an ex, uh, an experience I had that she was able to help me realize and make it relatable that relatable for me. So um, again, it, it just trying to see things from both point of view. That that was an experience that that she helped me kind of realize I, that there was some validity to. And I was like, wow, I never I never considered it from that perspective before. Thank you for making me think about that. Another thing, <clears throat> psychologically, I'm trying to sit in here and, and think about what a female must be feeling. So take me, for instance. Big man. I'm not, well, I'm not a big man. I'm not the smallest. <laughs> Compared to me, no, man. I'm not the smallest Look at dude. me. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I'm not the smallest dude around, but I, I understand I have a little bit of size on me. So uh, the average female is what? Five, 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 six, you think? No, sh- short, shorter. Sh- shorter than the average man. Shorter it's undebatable. So trying to sit here and think about what is it like for a woman to go through life. I'm not a female. I, I have no clue, but I'm trying to sit here and think. So I'm going to play that both sides of that aisle. Everybody around me is bigger than me. Right. Everybody around me 
not everybody. But you're, you're, ta- you're speaking in generalizations, but in general, that serves a good purpose. Here. Very generalization. Most men around me can harm me if they want to harm me. Yeah, and I can't do anything. Right. Most men around here, there's a possibility of them being a predator. Sure. There's a possibility of that. I'm sure. not saying they yeah. are. There's a good possibility. No, if I, I go you, to a, man, a men's prison, there's a good possibility. You're explaining this very well. I'm getting yeah. the crap beat out of me. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So they're told that, at least from my experience, you know, let the man open the door for you. They could have had a bad experience with a guy doing that, with a guy opening the door for them and expecting something in return. So then they Absolutely. get offended Absolutely. when a guy opens the door for them. Because this happened to me. A girl told me, I can do it myself. There are a lot of women who were told, you can do anything you put your mind to. You can do anything a man can do. I'm polarizing in the fact of, I would say, no, you cannot. Because a man cannot do everything a woman can do. A woman will raise a child way better than any man. And, and, and that's actually Naturally. a point I made at NPS, yes. It's a very good point to bring up. Uh, that there's different types. So, there's um, completely different types of of leadership. Of it's different types of de- leadership. Exactly. I was reading about it. I was re- if you you can read about it in Deep Survival, and you can read about it. I was reading about it um, in Sebastian Younger's book Tribe, and so Sebastian Younger is an author that I enjoy reading, but he's admittedly he's a very left leaning author, and and but but he does it with with an air of humility and self awareness that he could be wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. And that's what I enjoy about him. And so he, in his book Tribe, which is a book that's on a lot of reading lists for like Special Operations Forces, and it's, a very, it's also a very good work on PTSD, um, but he talks about the roles of uh, masculine and f- feminine leadership, and there is a difference, and different people fit into those roles differently. And what's interesting is, is if you follow the social science, that in the absence of men and women, even amongst groups of isolated men and isolated women, different men and different women within those groups will take on those roles. So there is a there's you're absolutely right that there is a psychological difference there, and there are there are uh, there there is a, a value of the different they're, they're different types of leadership, um, and that was the point that again but with my conversations with Janice that was that was something that I put out to her that she had never considered before, and she was like, hey, I'm going to read that book. So yeah, there was I mean we learned from each other, and that's kind of what I was getting at. So there's these differences of body anatomy. There's the differences of mental thought. There's these differences of, I mean, even talking emotionally, empathetically. Women are more empathetic. They're going to do a better job at understanding, which is why most women will go into a field of nursing. They'll go into a field of being a teacher because they're more empathetic. They're more understanding and more patient, obviously, with kids than most men generally are, which is why you see them female-dominated careers. But with the stigma of everybody's equal, as as one hundred percent not true. I don't well, believe. That. Well, let me throw this out there because this is another good example that kind of illustrates, you know, kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, I have a, a close female friend. She's a DEA agent, obviously, for for obvious reasons. I won't say her name here. But she's a DEA agent, and I, I went to visit her last winter on my way to go out ice climbing, and she Plug. had just what's that? Plug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ice climbing. Ice guys, climbing. That's what I do. Hey. <laughs> and I had a book with me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what, Teddy Roosevelt? That was something that people always said about him. He could be in the middle of the plains, he'd whoop out a book. But I'm not that smart. I'm not. I'm nothing like Teddy Roosevelt. So I do not take books when I ice climb. <laughs> Um, well, if you did, maybe you'd be president. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's exactly why. That's exactly why I might, maybe by a long shot, only be Secretary of Defense if I'm lucky, if all the stars align, right? Um, I, she had just been to SRT school, which is Special Response Team. It's their ver- DEA's version of a SWAT team, is, what, is how most people would know it. And she told a story of about how in in SRT school. They were doing, I think one of their, and she can beat me up later if I'm, do, if I'm saying this wrong and she happens to listen to this, but they were doing a scenario and um, in the federal government, in federal law enforcement, they, I think they call them jump outs where you basically, you got to like surround a car and you got to jump out and get the guy uh, or the driver, right, who's, a, who's presumably a threat. And something, as, as they were taking down a vehicle, 
something about the scenario they hadn't encountered before changed. It was a new uh, a new input of information, right? The suspect did something unexpected, and something he, that, he did, that the, the driver of the vehicle didn't have a mental model for. And so being a type A male, he jumped out of the vehicle and, and jumped whatever he had to do to tackle this new problem. But in the process, he forgot that he was driving this vehicle. <laughs> and so, yeah, right, he left the vehicle and drive. And his body. So she had another role in, 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 in the stack or whatever um, in, 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 on, on this team. And so she stepped out of her role and just jumped into that role and put the car in park. And she made the point of, to me that she's like, you know, you need both types of leadership on teams like that. You need both female and male leadership because females are a lot of times better at seeing the bitter, bigger picture while the male uh, members of the team are very good at the brute force and, and jumping on problems really quickly. And, I, and we just adapted and overcame. And she got a lot of kudos for that. And I thought that was a good illustration of that. But what she called it was dog brain, right? She's like, you know, it's some, a lot of times when you're type A, and I can speak to this because I've caught myself doing it, you can get dog brain. No lie, no kidding. I went dog sledding a couple days later in northern Michigan and while we were there the dog trainer told us that they don't put the alpha male in the lead they put mm-hmm. us dominant female in the lead because the alpha male will get distracted at, at the whatever the major um, input of information is and the female having the broader view will keep them on track and I, so I had to text her I was like well you know the whole dog brain thing you know yeah, yeah you're, you're right it it it, it the word dog brain really is a thing. You know, they, they do this in dogs for a reason. So um, not necessarily pushing back, but that's just what I'm saying there. Like, you know, that uh, there is a role there for female leadership there. And, and again, that's that's something that she kind of helped me um, to, I don't want to say realize, but that's just an example she provided me that illustrated that well. It's interesting. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. And she was absolutely right. Like, I, I was blown away. Like, she was just talking about the, you know, she's like, well, I was just dealing with the consequences of dog brain. She, and she didn't say it quite so pointedly like that. She was, you know, she was being just honest about the situation and telling me what happened. And then, you know, no kidding, here I am in dog sledding a couple of days later, and they're talking about, you know, alpha males have dog brain. They get, they get distracted, so we have to put a, a dominant female up front and, uh, and ahead of them to keep them on track. And I was like, well, miss, you're right. <laughs> That's definitely really interesting. I don't know what to think about that. Right. It's, it's yeah. something that I haven't. Obviously, I, I tend to take more standard roles with a traditional. You know, I think you've traditional, 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 right. traditional roles. Yeah. I do have the understanding of. Uh, sorry, I did it again. There we go. I do have the understanding of uh, like women bosses. There was uh, Jordan Peterson actually talked about it. Yeah, he does. They they do make very good bosses yeah. over other men. Yeah, <laughs> like that was interesting. Uh, <laughs> over other men because <laughs> women are able to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it, <laughs> but you didn't say it. Um, because they were able to. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of what the correct verbiage he used was. Um have multiple things going at once and think effectively. There was even another study done. Women they can multitask. Multitask. And I can they, tell you, I'm a horrible multitasker. So yeah. I can, Men generally can't multitask speak to that. as efficiently as women, which is what made the the female CEO a lot better. Now, do you just turn around and just make all CEOs for, uh, women just because of that? No, because you might not be getting the best person for that job. Let them apply for right. it or work for it. But well, what you're what you're digging into is more of a political sense now. You're talking yes. about like an ide- identity politics Correct. versus yes. that's yeah, not yeah. what I'm wanting. That's not at all what I want. Right. But that was definitely extremely interesting. Now, what he did talk about was women bosses over all women, and the differences that you would see. You wouldn't see the same. You wouldn't see the same outlook or answer. From what you what would you would have from a male dominated with a woman boss, because from what he talked about was women would hold more. Um, I guess the word would be angst or. or well, it's comp- it's competition. It at was that it point. was competition because yeah. of them being females, sure. which was very interesting to think about because it's like there's there's definitely 
competition, even amongst men. Well, I was going to say, it's no different than putting a bunch of ultra type A's in, in the same room, uh, type A men, and, and, and you're going to get the same result. I, you know, it just, it just is what it is. Yeah. So, you know, and I've struggled with some of that myself. So, yeah, I can speak to some of that. The. But I think what Dr. Dr. Peterson, he's, he's, he comes at it from more of an identity politics type of thing, and, and that's, a, that's a, an, an entirely uh, different topic. But Well, that was a Swedish study that, that was done. They, they, they did 50-50 with a lot of things, especially career field-wise, and they found that women would not go towards the STEM field, so then they kind of forced it that yeah, way. Yeah, he's, he's talking about, um, and, 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 and uh, you might even be talking about, I think you're talking about Joe Rogan's podcast, where I think that's, that his visit there is when, when he talks about uh, a lot of this. And again, it goes back to what I think I was saying, is that there's, there's different types of leadership, both feminine and masculine, mm-hmm. however you want to define that, and, and they both, play an undeniably important role in our society. Now, for the naysayers, right, because Dr. Peterson is generally revered as a more right-leaning researcher, okay, Sebastian Younger, who is a more left-leaning, who I respect both. I will say this. Jordan Peterson is not right-leaning. Well, I I, I, I said he's considered. He's considered right-leaning, but he's admitted that he is not. Fair enough, but he's con- he's viewed that way. That's Correct. the perspective. Correct. So what I'm saying is, for folks who discount him because of that, well, okay, that's why I t- I, I try to take my information from multiple mm-hmm. sources here and, and 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 see where the intersections are. Sebastian Younger, who's admittedly a, a more left leaning or viewed as a more left leaning, even though I think he's he's a pretty self aware guy, a more left leaning author comes to the same conclusions in much the same way. So again, there's there's the intersection for you. There's the overlap, and 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 sometimes that's tough to do. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about living in an information rich society, right? Uh, or or just in an information rich environment. It sometimes it's it takes time to do that kind of research, right? It's time consuming. It it, it is time consuming to make good decisions. It's a lot easier to go off the cuff and and in appease your inner animal, if that's what you want to call it, your, your lower order being and, and be emotional about things. That feels good. It appeases us emotionally when we do that. It appeases us emotionally when we tell someone they're wrong and why they're wrong in a forceful way. Um, and, it's, it, it, and simultaneously, it makes us feel good when we only consume information that, cons- that confirms our worldview or worse yet, we read through information and only find the parts of it that confirms our worldview and accept that as fact and everything else is false. That feels good to us. It's a visceral good feeling. But it's not the way we should be conducting our business. It's not how we should be uh, conducting ourselves as a society. It's 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 dangerous to democracy, to our republic, to our system of government. You know, our government is designed to be slow and a system and a process for a reason, right? So that we're not making decisions on the whims of mobs and crowds and, and public opinion. And then there's time for debate and time for research. Um, however, again, when, when you can express your view at the click of a button on social media, and we live in this an information-rich environment and, and have access to make our opinion known and appease that inner urge at the click of a button, it, it, it's leading us down a very bad road. And so, you know, uh, I, I think the discussions you and I are having are great because we're just, not only are we – bouncing off each other and our ideas, but we're including other things we've heard other people say through research and, and other experiences, and that's how it should be. And then we're, we're finding the intersections here and drawing the, the logical conclusions from that. But we're almost two and a half hours into this podcast here. Two of hours, dis- 44 minutes. Of discussing, of discussion. How many folks out there are, are doing two and a half, two, an hour, two hours and 45 minutes of research before they post their opinion or come to a conclusion on Facebook. Who's having three hours of discussion with one person? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Dr. Sanjay Gupta did an episode with Joe Rogan in the beginning. He said, I don't think I've ever had a discussion long enough for three hours with one person. Really? It was either at the very beginning or the very end. He said that. He said, I've never had a discussion for three hours with somebody. Did he say he felt better for having the experience? You should watch the episode uh, uh, and see how he felt. Probably better. sure. I know. I know there was. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm. I, I'm sure there. I, I know there were both sides because now, 
I know there was contention there, but um, it was a very good. It but was g- a, it was good. It, you know why it was, it was good? A very good it, episode. It, it was good because it was challenging of ideas on either side, and that's that is more how our discourse should be occurring in the United States. You know, and again, very well, somebody could listen to this podcast and they could say, "Well, I heard Bob Wagner on your podcast um, saying, um, I don't know, pro. I guess you could say pro." feminist ideas or something just because I threw I was being a contrarian and, and threw something I learned I said no no what I'm doing is, is I'm I'm collecting evidence from from every possible source here and I'm trying to find out where the where the information overlaps to draw good conclusions and that's hard to do that takes time and it it also takes self-awareness kind of what we were talking about to being a good leader that's a developed skill and it takes a uh, you know and I'm not I'm not you know, tooting my own horn here, uh, but it takes a, a tremendous amount of reflection to get to the point where you can do that. Trust me, I had a lot of learning to get that I had to do, and I'm still learning to get to this point. And anybody but, can do that too. That's what I'm saying. It's it's not a, it's it's not like I, me or anybody that might be like me has a monopoly on it just because we went and studied these things or something. Anybody can do that, and that's why I, I was saying what your point about education earlier is that it can be a multitude of things as long as you're just absorbing information and then critically examining it analyzing it and synthesizing it and finding out what it means for you and, and where it overlaps with other pieces of information that's education you don't have to go somewhere formally but we can all do that and that's what we should and and i make an argument that if we want to preserve our republic if we want to reserve, preserve our democracy our system of government in an information rich society and in a in the social media age then as individuals and we talked about this in the ghost episode we have an individual responsibility as citizens to make the attempt to do that, to, to, to learn to be civil again and to learn to conduct ourselves and our discussions civilly. And that requires an investment on our part individually as citizens. It also requires you to get out of your comfort zone. Exactly. I mean, I'm not very comfortable sitting on here talking, <laughs> especially with <laughs> me not being able to articulate words to save my life. <laughs> but... I'm sitting here in a suit, yes. man. I, you know, I'm not comfortable either. Yeah, you showed up in that suit and <laughs> me all confused. <laughs> I'm but you're absolutely guy. right. No, but it takes. I, I I wasn't always as more debatable, yeah, kind of person when I first started listening to this kind of stuff. But then I would always be told, uh, I was told things like uh, politics and the firehouse should never mix, right? Uh, religion and the firehouse should never mix. Right. I, me personally, I disagree. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's good you disagree, good. and the reason why I disagree. As, and I brought that up, and I think another podcast episode, I think it was with Andy Plofton, I think I said that in that episode. I might be wrong. And he said it shouldn't because that's how you can get guys that are upset. I'm like, well, if we're getting guys that are ups- guys and gals that are getting upset because of politics and the firehouse that we're supposed to count on each other to save their lives just because they have a difference of opinion, that's an issue. It's a deeper problem, right? It's a huge problem. Deeper it, problem. Could that be part of the problem yeah. that is leading to these guys and these gals that are having such a, a wide range of hatred towards each other or visceral feelings of of uh, neglectfulness of wanting to do better yeah because i believe that if you have those awkward discussions if you have those weird discussions and not attack each other because i've been involved with well there's the key i've been sitting there with there's what there's the key, the, the civility key, yeah. part, not attacking it's, each other. And I've been involved in discussions at the, at the table at the firehouse where people get upset and say things, and I get it. You know, you get upset, you get your feelings hurt, you say something you, you, you regret. I, I've probably been a part of that. I've been the victim of that, and I've been also the attacker on that. But it's also a huge learning curve. And then when you have to have those con- those hard conversations with people, they're easier to have because you sure. have that experience of the debate of differences of opinions. Sure. I think it makes it a lot better and it makes it more understandable. That way you hear both sides. You hear that person's point of view. I'm never always right, ever. But I can definitely bring up things that are applicable to the conversation or facts that I seem to be fit for that for that discussion and topic. And if that person can bring up better ones, then I should just sit back and reflect to see, am, am I wrong or am I right? Most guys and most people are stubborn that they want to be right and they're not willing to admit they're right, which uh, there's a lot of people that I know that are like that. I've been like that too. I'm not saying I haven't. 
there's definitely a, a, a missing link of the discourse anywhere you go with those types of discussions, which I think is, is leading to a problem because the less you know about your enemy, the more you can, the easier it is to hate him. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not gonna lie to you. I have, I've never heard that before. Just now thought about it. <coughs> <Teamed> it. <laughs> but I believe, but it's true. If like the things you uh, told me about uh, Anthony Fauci, yeah, when you, when you had him talk at, not you had him talk, but when he talked at MPS, you gave me your perspective of it, and it kind of reminded me of when, a uh, little plug here, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, I went no. to the White House and listened to Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi talk. <laughs> I, I added an S in there somehow. <laughs> um, regardless of my feelings towards her, I, I, I don't agree with her politically on a lot of things, um, but actually listening to her talk getting the view if I'm trusting in what she's actually saying at that time I was like she's not as bad as what so and so makes her out to be she's and she's a, doing a job and she's doing a job and she's somebody in a position that she was voted for and yes. from her constituents that she has that, to answer to that she has to answer to and yeah. to represent yes whether I disagree with her or not, which right. I, I'll, I'll admit, I very I disagree with her a lot, but it wasn't as demonized exactly after I saw her and listened to her talk. Now, would I pay to go listen to her talk? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. But it it really made me think. I'm like, oh, okay. I she's can, a person too. She's a person too, and I need to be aware of that. So when I see these people on the news that they're demonized on the right or left. Uh, obviously, if the person is being demonized because they've done a terrorist act, I'm not going to be like, well, this is what, no, but you did something right. pretty bad. But the, the political reasons yeah. and they're being demonized for that. It's they're people too. And they have representatives and there are some that are just evil. Like they're just mean. They're just vindictive. And <laughs> she's nuts, man. Um, <laughs> she's fine. <laughs> um, but it really opened my eyes up. And that's why it's like whenever I have that discussion with somebody either at work or wherever I'm at, it's always interesting because behind that, they have a story of why they believe that certain way. You know, you'll 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 laugh at me here, but, you know, one of the um, and again, it, I'll preface this by saying somebody because I'm prov because I'm providing some contrarian views, somebody could easily listen to this and think that I lean a particular way uh, politically and the answer to that is no I'm just trying to seek the truth and a, a lot of seeking the truth is just showing some empathy and empathy doesn't it, it doesn't it, it's not a word of weakness right empathy is not in fact it, we talk about the intelligence community right the best thing you can do in the intelligence community is get to know your adversary Right, and so the word empathy is thrown around in the intelligence community. If you want to know about something, you want to know about a topic or or a people group, you show empathy and try to think like them. And then, then like you said, the more you know about your enemy, it's harder to to view them as such. Um, and so again, somebody could easily listen to this and say, "Well, Bob Wagner's providing contrarian views on this stuff. He must lean this way politically." And they could they could be completely wrong about where uh, I rest. But that's because I'm just trying to arrive at the truth, and I think at the core of arriving the truth is empathy. And so what I was going to say is, you know, one of the, uh, a document, have you, have you watched the documentary on uh, Hillary Clinton's life? That was suggested by my uh, classmates at NPS, and it was actually suggested by a lot of my very conservative classmates, because they just, for the reason that you said, it just, when you watch that, well, now you can disagree with it fundamentally, you can disagree with the motives, but you realize watching it, you're like, okay, she's just somebody who had ambitions of having a political career. Now, you can make what you want of the rest of it, but it did it did have a humanizing effect for those folks who had watched it. And so, you know. You think that was the point? <laughs> well, there's a, but no, there's a strong argument there's, to be made about that, yeah. too. That, that you, right. And, and if, as you watch it, I'll be frank, and uh, there are, there are s subjects in that movie that are, you can tell, are intentionally avoided. I'll put it that way. Oh, so yeah. yes, there, there is there, and as with any piece of media, 
there, there's always is, somebody's telling a story. I don't want to say the word narrative because it gives a, ne- a negative connotation, but somebody is telling a story, and and you generally the storyteller gets to tell the story how they want to. So, yes, there there is an element of that there. Mm-hmm. However, there is you know it, it was it was fair enough that certain members of my cohort who were conservative and right leaning felt that it was it provided some value. Now, did it change their political opinion or their stance? Not necessarily, but. Like you said, it was just like the same effect it had with, um, you know, uh, Congresswoman Pelosi, where you're like, okay, she's she's a person, and she experiences things just like I do, and to me, that gets back to the core of, that's the solution for, or the beginning of the solution for, the loss of civility we've had throughout American politics. I, I enjoy politics. I, I like know. politics, but I'm in the minority. I like debate. I like politics. But it has to be done civilly. One of my favorite people to debate with is my good friend David Pfeiffer. He's a, an Eastern Kentucky University professor. And he and I have just gone to straight blows on Facebook in debate. I mean, just slugged it out, you know. And you would, But we're, we're close friends, and I like it that way. As I like it, he's somebody who can take that, and I can take it, and we can, get, we can cover a lot of ground that way. But n- not a lot of folks have that anymore. Uh, you know, uh, uh, social media... Social media dehumanizes communication in so many ways, and it makes it so hard to interpret the message, and, and, and you can take it how you want, and, then, and, and often, because of our human nature, we always take it in the negative way versus a positive way, and then con- consequently, now we're at each other's throats. And um, So I think the solution to some of that is just what you said. Real quick on that. Do you think, this is something that I've always brought up that is a very... Um, it seems pretty evil, but I've always thought that there's reasons why things, certain things didn't happen back in the day that they do now. Do you think with the, if you're going to be voicing your opinion or you're doing something that somebody finds offensive, making a comment towards somebody else and they'd have a violent reaction without that person who committed that violent reaction being punished, do you think that a lot of that stuff being made illegal and people being punished for responding in certain ways has made things easier for other people to get to say things that they wouldn't have before? So let's let, let's go back to like the Wild West. You talking about the old Facebook tough guy? The Facebook tough guy. Yeah. You, in the Wild West, you would say, uh, I don't know what you would say. I don't like the way your boots are shining. <laughs> and then the guy say, meet me out in the alley. And then you meet him out in the alley, and he's like, you draw on two. And Is then, that your Alex Jones voice? <laughs> no, that's not my Alex Jones voice. <laughs> no, I'll do that maybe. Uh, um, but you would you would have that threat. I'm not saying we need to go back to that. But do you, I think that there is a change in discourse when that's getting moved out of the yeah, way, and yeah. then now all of a sudden we have that protect because it's you, easy, it's easy and it's gratifying. I'm going to use somebody as an example that you know, okay, Kurt. Okay, Poor Kurt, Kurt. Discord, you know, yeah, the nickname, biggest talker. <laughs> Poor guy. I love Kurt to death. He's a good. I, I'd want him on my side if I want someone to talk trash. Heck yeah. But when you have the protection, usually <laughs> of some bigger dudes, I, so I'm assuming this has happened. Gets louder. This has happened, louder. huh? Once the protection moves away, it gets quiet. <laughs> I'm kidding. It, no, you're need, right. You're onto something. We don't need to go into that story, but it was a very funny. <laughs> but uh, you're but absolutely onto the something. only example I can use that. Yeah. it's a visual example. Yeah, it's the barking dog behind the fence, and then once the fence is removed. Is yeah, he still barking? Yeah. Is 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 he worth his? Abs- absolutely. You're absolutely right. That and social media has created an environment. Actually, I talk again. Um, I think I mentioned him before. Steve Espinoza is a NYPD captain who was in, in my cohort at MPS, who I'm, I speak with pretty routinely. He made that same comment the other day, that f- the ability to say whatever you want in a very biting manner, at the click of a button, and never having to look the person in the eye has absolutely increased the volatility of the way in which we address each other. And it's terrible. And in fact, I recently, I used to be, you know, you talk to anybody who knows my personality anyways, right? I'm very disagreeable, as Jordan Peterson would say. Uh, I used to 
be like a, a Facebook boxing champion, right? Like I would just look for opportunities on Facebook to just rumble, right? And that's where like David and Pfeiffer and I I'd always go back to old reliable David Pfeiffer. So we could have a good knock knockout drag out Facebook deb- uh, debate, but um, I've kind of taken the opposite approach now because I realize how damaging that's become for our society and how bad it is. And I think Dave has too. And, and people that we used to kind of get in those groups and have those those fun conversations with. I, we were having fun, but everybody reading them was watching a different movie, so to speak. Everybody reading them, everybody reading them thought we were seriously at each other. And then that created other problems, and it had this systemic effect. And so I've kind of taken the opposite pr- approach these days, where I've started calling people out on their bad behavior. Now, it, that's hard to do in a very diplomatic way, all right? And that's and 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 doing so undiplomatically is almost contrary to the point, right? To what you're actually trying to accomplish. However, going back to Jocko Willing talking about, you know, sometimes you just kick somebody off the boat. There is a, and righteous anger, which is another biblical mm-hmm. uh, principle that that you can invoke there. There is no such thing as a righteous time to 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 be forceful and say, "You need to stop. What you're doing is damaging and harmful, and you need to shut up." And I've started doing that a little bit. Not now again, the time to be diplomatic far is, is far greater. There's far more instances where you need to be diplomatic versus you need to be pointed like that. But those few times where it is the proper time to be pointed should be seized upon, in my opinion. And it should be seized upon by folks who care about other people and care about our country and care about uh, our future. Because if you don't, if there's there's experts in my field in Homeland Security who are predicting another civil war by the time of the next election cycle. If that doesn't scare the hell out of you, I don't know what will. It scares me. And so that's changed my outlook. It's changed the way I approach things. And now I've been, I found myself more and more just telling people to shut up and be nicer, which is kind of hard to do because you're not being nice when you say that. But, yeah. but going back to righteous anger, there's a time and a place. There's a time and a place for that. And, and so when I see that, I don't pass it up anymore because I know the reverberating effect that it can have if people just continue to run their mouths without any consideration for the consequences or the effect they're having on their neighbors and their fellow countrymen. It's bad. With the comment of the research of... What are, what are those guys? The ones that are going to be predicting the next civil war being the next election cycle. Uh, it's just if you if just you pay attention to academics and yeah researchers and people in, in at the academic level of my field. I don't think it's going to be too surprising to be honest, because of what we just went through the past two years, to a lot of people. The during that time in the past two years, that in that first year. The government came out with documents saying that UFOs were real. We're really going to start talking about UFOs. Just give me a second. Okay. No one cared. (laughs) Nobody cared. Sure. Because times were so crazy. Sure. People were just like, yeah, I don't care what happened. Yeah. This is what's going on now. Sure. So when that time comes that there's going to be a civil war, it's not going to be, and I'm sure you've thought of this too, it's not going to be, you know, one side versus the other side. We're meeting on Tuesday night. We're going to go right. to, you know, we're going to Ohio, and that's where we're going to start. Some people, some experts suggest that we've already seen the opening shots. Yes, the shot her around the world could have been a few years ago. Yeah, with certain groups. Yeah. Then it's just a prolonged, smaller war. Which there are groups out there. Well, look at look in the eighteen sixties. We talked about this in the ghost episode, right? The the Civil War, the American Civil War, the the, the original one. If we if if we are in the midst of of, uh, of a new one, yeah, it started in eighteen sixty one. But you know, look at the late eighteen fifties, or even the early eighteen fifties, and everything that led up to that. Mm-hmm. You know, it didn't just come. They didn't just wake up one day and decide to start shelling Fort Sumter and and declare. That they were succeeding, you know, like it, 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 it was a process that you could watch over time in our politics. And so, um, to what you're saying, I agree with you 100. percent It's not gonna look, ex- especially in the information. We're in a new age right now, right? We're in the information age, our social media age. Warfare itself does not look the way that we traditionally conceptualize it in the West. And you, we talked about that too. How we have a very, as Americans, we have a very Western view of warfare. And 
a very traditional view of warfare, and it it, it involves people shooting guns at each other, shoot, firing weapons at each other on a field of battle. And as a consequence of that, we fail to recognize the war that's currently being waged against us by China, Russia, Iran, and a little bit of North Korea, and anybody else who wants in on it, um, vis-a-vis social media and the Internet and information, Right. And, and again, that's, that's our own fault because we have our, our, this traditional conceptualization. You, know, much as you, you can compare us to the British when we, were, when we fought the Revolutionary War and the British wanted to line up in nice, neat ranks and, and, um, and shoot at people head on in brightly colored coats on open fields. You know, and that's us now. And, and we're, way, we're, we're behind. We're, and, and so we don't even recognize what's happening in front of us. War is being waged against us, quite literally. It's warfare. If, if you look at the definition of warfare. Uh, one of my favorite professors at MPS, uh, Dr. Seth Jones, he wrote In the Graveyard of Empires. He wrote, just wrote a book about this called Three Dangerous Men that says just that. And so we're missing all the signs that are right in front of us, and I, that absolutely applies to if, if, if we experience some kind of civil conflict here in the United States. It's not going to look like the, the war of the 1860s. Well, I mean, we've already had civil conflict, plenty of it. I mean, you, you sure. look at uh, Portland, Oregon. The, there is... Well, you can a paint a trend that, across it, right? Yeah, like yeah, it's there's uh, a group that took over a, a few city blocks and held that for I think a couple of weeks. Well, and we talked about the capital scenario, we talk, we, and we, we talked talk, about that in the ghost episode, I believe. I mean, it just, just all across it, if you take all of it together, it is political violence. It it, it meets the definition of political mm-hmm. violence, and and so and and like I said earlier, if you hold me to what I said earlier. War is armed politics, and now we're talking about political violence. Are they not one and the same? And a strong argument can be made that that. And another point that I I've, I've made before is that you know the American Revolution started with civil unrest. What about war on education? Are you and talking I, about folks that? Well, okay. So here's what I'll say about you're talking about the education issue, and 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 here's what I'll here's what I'll say about the education, or what I feel comfortable saying within my current roles and realms. You remember earlier I said that people have a say in how their how the fire department responds to their emergencies, and that's politics. Well, people have a say in how they are educated and their children are educated. That, that sometimes that bothers. It bothers. So the example I'll use sometimes is firefighters. It bothers us when a citizen wants to have a say in how we provide fire protection because we're the experts, right? But you know what? That's their right. That's 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 the the principle of democracy, which is a uh, or a principle of democracy that is a foundation of our republic. Well, the same applies in education, and a lot of time the experts, the educators, educators don't like to hear that. But th- at the end of the day, if they're working in pu- in public education, is the dog okay? She's breathing something in heavy. She's She's something caught her interest over there. Yeah. Sometimes it bothers. The experts, it bothers the educators to be reminded that folks get to have a say in how they conduct their business in public education. And you know what? And they do in private business, in private education too, right? Because if, if because then it becomes customer based. If I don't like what you're saying or what you're teaching or how you're going about your business in, in the private world, well, then I just don't pay to come to your institution or I don't pay for my kids to come to your institution. And so there, there you go. So, you know. Everybody has a boss, right? And the, and the citizenry is the boss in that case, in the case of government. That's how it should be. And so it, it bothers folks, just like it would bo- bother a firefighter if, if, if when a citizen is outspoken about how fire protection should be provided. But, but we, it is a constitutional principle, and politics is our outlet. And so we have a say in, in how education is provided in this country, just like the citizens have a say in how police and fire protection are provided. So let's try to end this on a... Oh, let me switch this over to that lady. We didn't see you do the. Nah, dab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like well, you did the dab right there. Oh yeah. <laughs> so let's end this on a brighter note, other than doom and gloom. What would you say is the best thing about our country? Mm-hmm. Wow, you really put me on the spot with that one. Because it's obviously, I believe a lot in our country. I love our country, and I. But it could be a de- it could be a long answer. <sighs> well, I'm, I know, knowing you, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, man. Wait, that's that's the old way of telling me to shut up. <laughs> no, no, and no. There's a lot of people at home cheering right now. <laughs> yeah, tell them to shut up. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna tell you. To shut up. <laughs> no, I, it's a very 
the reason why I asked that question. I would say resilience before you keep going, just oh, so I don't lose it. The reason why I asked that question is because it starts with either a single sentence, but then breaks into so much more. Oh, yeah, it does. You, yeah, because you can't just give, we're resilient. Uh, you can't just give a, a, no, a blanket statement there. We're resilient. We're, as a nation, we're resilient. Democracy is resilient. Our republic is resilient. Uh, it is, to this point, it stood the test of time. And I'm confident that it will continue to, and I'm confident, I'm hopeful. Now, hope isn't a good plan, I acknowledge that, but I am hopeful for the sake of all of us that American Americans will rediscover, they will, they will rediscover the value of what we have in our system of government and our way of life, and they will rediscover how to be civil to one another and, and how they act towards one another. Um, but we're, we're resilient. And just as General Mattis says, you know, there's a lot of things as a nation we've done wrong. But when you compare us to a lot of other parts of the world, such as the folks that would like to see us fail, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, we're pretty darn good. We've done a lot of good in the world, and we stand for a, a lot of really good things. And somebody, a friend from Europe, whether she realizes it or not, made an offhand comment to me one day, I think while I was in Belgium, that, no, 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 it's what, after I came home, because, you know, obviously uh, we didn't get to talk about Grimp Day and all this, but just through my Grimp Day contacts, she made a comment to me, and I don't think she even realized how impactful it was on me or, or even the depth of what she said. But somehow, to give you the context, we were talking about America and some kind of problem. And she just lightly said, well, I, I hope you figure it out because the rest of the world is relying on you. And that, that hit me right here, man. That hit me right here cause it, um, because I, I wish I could have recorded that and shown it to every American. Like, hey, we have a, we have a responsibility to get our act together and to maintain our place of leadership in the world. And, and I don't mean that from an arrogant, egotistical place because that's, where, that's, that's easily where the detractors like to go. Well, that's imperialistic. That's this. That's that. Whatever. Okay? Follow the history. Follow uh, the history of our nation after the fall of the Soviet Union. Well, after World War II and, and the West. Uh, On Grand Strategy, a great book by On... Uh, by um, John Lewis Gaddis that really gets to the heart of this. Um, for somebody on the outside looking in to make that comment so lighthearted to me that the rest of the world's relying on you, I mean, uh, you know, how could you not hear that and just f- be filled with this sense of responsibility and duty to do the right thing? I don't, I don't, but uh, that there's your answer. That was beautiful. Ooh. Brought a damn tear to my eye. Ooh. Man, Bob, thank you so much, dude, for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me, me, man. I hope I don't I hope I hope you don't lose listeners as a result of having you on here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. There's not too many listeners at the beginning. Uh, That's all right. Was it was it Thomas Paine that said, uh, he who dares not tell the truth or well, yeah, he who dares not offend dares not tell the truth or something like that. I'm probably getting that backwards, but you know. That Sometimes sounded, I'm the holy fool, man. It sounded all right. That sounded good, didn't it? Yeah. Until I doubted it. I should have just went with it, dude. The confidence is key. That's true. <laughs> dude, thank you so much, man. I hope I get to have you on again. I hope you'll have me back, man. And um, oh, and while I'm thinking about it, for anybody who's listening who decides that they, if you've made it this long, God bless you if you have. <laughs> God bless you if you've listened to me talk for three hours. Seriously. But um, if, if you are listening and you decide you want information, whether it be on NPS or if you want to take me up on my offer to, to help you out, I'm more than willing. I, I mean that. Um, you can you can either and and, and um, Matt will provide his information. and You can get a hold of me there, or you can get a hold of me directly at Circle City Safety Solutions at Gmail dot com. That's that's my LLC. Again, that's Circle City Safety Solutions at Gmail dot com, uh, or you can get get a hold of me directly through Matt. Uh, or if you ha- if you do after listening to this, you have any questions or any additional additional ideas. I mean, I, I certainly welcome that. Even if you just have a comment you want to make. You might make me think about something that I didn't think about, or you want to challenge me on something. As I said, I like a good debate. I'm not going to shy away from one. So, um, heck, let's 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 get together and hash it out even better. So, 
Um, that man, thanks for spending all. Considering the names you've had on here, man, I'm I'm standing in much Johnny's place. Yeah, you made it to the very end of the video. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you do want to contact Bob, I'll put his email in the description. You can also contact me through Instagram, which is more with Stumpo. Also on Facebook, more with Stumpo, and I will patch you through to him. I hope you guys have a great and happy new year, and God bless.